at the end of time. Thirteen. O'clock. Hey, everybody. What's going on? It's Wednesday. Yeah, we got a new camera. Yeah. Oh, you, oh look, the microphone's blocking Spock. Well, I, I put it up and it fell back down. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Hey, Zach is here. Good news. I'm clean. Oh, good. <laughs> I thought you were going to say you were pregnant. <laughs> That also would have been funny. That'd be fucking hilarious. Yeah, we rearranged the um, uh, room. Oh, it's the same room, but we didn't change anything in the background. That's been there the whole time. We just moved the yeah. camera to where it was. Yeah, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, American Military 100 said, Yes, another serial killer who was a Leo. The story behind Gerard Schaefer is fascinating. This guy, I'm honestly, I don't know why. He's a Florida man. And um, I honestly don't know why I didn't know anything about him prior to doing this show. Because this guy was a fucking man. He was a piece of work. I think maybe the reason is that he was ultimately only convicted only of two murders. However, uh, they do suspect that he may be killed as many as... I've seen from 28 to 32, um, his own recollections are between 80 and 110, um, but I don't know, and he's dead now, so, um, so I don't know if we're ever gonna figure that out, because, but there are a lot of cases that they think were probably him, but they couldn't prove it for various reasons, because they hadn't found the bodies, or something like that, so he was, like I said, only convicted of two, so it's like, in that technical sense, he's not even really considered a serial killer serial he's just like a suspected serial killer he says it was about 100 though yeah okay which considering how many they think that he did kill i don't really think that that's too much although he was he seemed like a bit of an exaggerator in the same way that he's very much a btk type and it's interesting because just kind of accidentally we ended up watching um that uh mini series that you know documentary series about btk that is on hulu like it came out last year and it's uh katherine ramsland like you know they're talking about it's kind of based on the same book that i read that sophie sent me it's a good series where she yeah where she corresponded with him for like 10 years or whatever and um yeah so they made like a like a mini series about it so we were watching that and and i had been researching gerard john schaefer too and i was just kind of like man these dudes are like they would have hung out i kind of feel like if they were in the same area because they have a lot of the same pathologies and a lot of the same this dude seemed well i don't want to say i don't know if he was even more narcissistic and arrogant than btk was because that's a pretty tall order i think it was pretty similar although i think some of the shit this dude said later on was like a little bit crazier but maybe not i don't know we'll get into that but it's just it, i don't know i just kind of found it interesting that these two were kind of he's a little bit of a ted bundy type too because there was possibly at least according to him um some necrophilia going on so um we'll get into that too and i'm Sure, all of the horrible shit that we're going to be talking about on this episode, is this is going to get demonetized, so... <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> that that BTK uh, series is good. It is, really yeah. Good. I was, And there's a, lot of, uh, there's a lot of fucking Dennis's voice in there over the phone and talking, and it helped me polish up on my fucking BTK voice, you know. <laughs> yeah, I used to be a monster. Of course I'm a monster. <laughs> I'd be a little bit of a monster. A monster. <laughs> you know, he's worshiping up. Worship up. Yeah, I'm going to worship up a little bit. Yeah, all that Midwestern. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I was, trying, I was getting into the it, it, into the uh, the Dennis vibe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well. Because <laughs> there was, yeah, there was a lot yeah, of him. Yeah, a lot of him Well, because like I said, Catherine Ramsland wrote that book about him, and so she had recorded like all yeah. of the phone calls, and she had all the letters and stuff like that. So. Yeah. Well, good evening. Hello. <laughs> how are you how are you <laughs> he's trying to flirt with her over the phone and shit I mean yeah, yeah. 
It's, uh, it's, yeah. Tammy says, hey, there's Spock. Yeah, we moved him back into the background. I said, he's like the mascot. We gotta put him back in there. Yeah. Uh, hey, Dave. How are you doing? Says, hello, long time no see live. But hi, you two. Yeah, you haven't been in the chat for a little while. Uh, it turns out we actually did do a live stream on Monday. Uh, review of the Meg 2, the trench. But it was taken down because Warner Brothers apparently thought we violated their copyright. How did we violate their copyright? Well, that's what I said. So I sent him an email and I'm just like, um, yeah. how can that be? Because it's like, yeah. we didn't even show the fucking trailer for the shit. Yeah. And it's like, and I've seen like lots of other YouTubers that did reviews of that, that used like little clips from it or from the trailer or something like that. I'm like, we didn't even do that. We were just like two assholes sitting there talking about the movie and we even liked the movie. Yeah. So what's your fucking problem? So it's just AI did it. Probably. Well, yeah. like I said, it came from, well, see, I don't know if it came from Warner Brothers. Yeah. It said that it did, but I was like, well, I don't know if that's their official account or if it's just somebody being a dick or I don't really know. So, was. um, so I don't know. So I wrote to them to get it like reinstated, but it might not. I, so I don't know. I haven't heard from them. Cause I was like, bro, I don't even know what your fucking problem is. Yeah. Like, do you not want anybody talking about your movies? Cause I, you know, Probably. fine. I won't. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know what I mean? Don't go see any Warner Brothers movies there. Maybe they didn't like how I, de <laughs> how I described it being kind of like a like a Chinese Godzilla movie. Well, the stupid thing about it is, like I said, I saw like a bunch of other channels had reviewed it, and a lot of them didn't like it. Really? And it's like they didn't take, and they didn't take those videos down, at least as far as I know. Huh. It just seemed weird. But I have heard, like, from other sources that Warner Brothers is real, uh... You know, is real stringent yeah. about copyright to a degree where it's like ridiculous like they're kind of known for it yeah. so I don't know like you said it's probably just like some fucking algorithm it's doing it it's like somebody I... mentioned the movie yeah we gotta turn that off we gotta turn it off yeah. <laughs> yeah Dave said I went and seen the Meg 2 yesterday I just loved it so silly and fun it yeah, was like we, yeah we liked it. it was a fun movie yeah. yeah I thought it was cool yeah we saw it so I actually thought it was better than the first one I don't know what those guys are saying that that it, that it wasn't as good as, you know, that, that the first one was better. No, I think the second one was better. Well, some of the ones that I saw didn't really like either one of them, but really? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but, um, yeah, I guess I didn't remember much about the first one, to be honest with you. I don't but... remember much about the second one now. <laughs> well, yeah. Like I said, it was just like a big, dumb, fun yeah. action was, movie. Yeah. No, but I said the thing that pissed me off the most, you know, I was like, oh, well, if, if it had just been the review of... Um, of Meg 2 and they took it down I'd have been like that ah, well too bad so sad but we talked about other shit on there yeah. like we talked about adopting our new cat Yeah. which you know if you weren't here for the Monday show we adopted another kitty so we have three now but we talked about that and I'm like man that's that really pisses me off that they took that down because we talked about stuff that wasn't even about the fucking movie so you know what I mean yeah um Tammy said, what could you have violated by only talking about the movie? That's what I was trying to figure out. And, like, that's what I wrote in the thing. I was just like, how is it violating your copyright just by talking about the movie? I was like, we didn't even show part of the trailer or nothing. It's right. like, what the fuck is your problem? I didn't show any stills from it. And it was, the only picture that I used from it was in the thumbnail. Yeah. And you're allowed to do that. That's fair use. So, I don't know what their problem is. They're stupid. Don't go see their movies because they're stupid. <laughs> they probably own everything. But, um, but yeah, so, uh, somebody, wait, Camp Guy said, lots of killers out of Florida, big state, lots of population. Yeah, the heat probably drives people crazy, too, I imagine. Well, tracks crazy people. Yeah, a, a lot of people do move here yeah. because of the weather, and like I said, and then it kind of cooks their brains, I think is, is one of the things. Because we have people from everywhere, yeah. you know what I mean? And it's just kind of like, it if is. You're in the south and you're crazy. Kind of a crazy place. If you're place. in the south and you're crazy, you're going to end up with three places. New Orleans. Atlanta or somewhere in Florida. Yeah. That's like the crazy magnets. Yeah, for whatever yeah, reason. For, for Southerners. No, this place attracts New Yorkers, too. But they're like retirees. Yeah. Mostly. Because it's, you know, hot down here. So yeah. they're like sick of the cold weather. They don't want to yeah. shovel snow anymore. <laughs> they stick out like sore thumbs. I guess you spot them a mile away. Camp Guy says, Charlie Brandt, Florida Keys serial killer. We should probably do a show about him, yeah. too. Weird case. Based on his MO, the police think he may have killed way more than the four they know for sure. He suicided after killing his wife. Yeah, this guy, like I said, I suspect... I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd go as far as, like, him. Because I think he was a little bit boastful 
because he was one of those guys because i feel like btk was like this too where it's like they wanted to be like the best serial killer they could be which is pretty fucked up i was like yeah goals okay so um because he was very this guy gerard schaefer was really into his image like he was really into talking about it. it's like oh you know i hang out with ted bundy in prison because i think they were in the same prison for a while and um you know, and he told me that one one m double murder that he did in Washington State or Oregon, it's like he was homaging me. You know what I mean? So he was, like, trying to, like, drop... And I was like, even among fucking serial killers, they're, like, just bitchy name-dropping. It's yeah. ridiculous. And another thing that he said, too, and I don't know if this is true or not, but he said, Gerard said, that when... Because a lot of his letters, if you want to read, because he wrote, because um, I'll get into this in a little bit, but he wrote like a lot of stories and he wrote a lot of shit about, um, you know, being in prison and everything. And um, he said that when Ted Bundy got executed, that you could hear him like howling and screaming like a bitch, like all through the prison. <laughs> and then he was talking, and, and he said before they even did it, like he was howling like a bitch when they were shoving the um, cotton balls up his ass. Like, <laughs> Like, and all this other stuff. He so, did that? Well, I don't know. That's what I mean. Just, this is a serial killer talking. So it's like, I'm not really sure how much talk. I don't talk. know if they do that. I, well, that's what I mean. It's like, I, when I had never heard of that, but yeah. I was like, well, it kind of makes sense because you don't want them, like, shitting all over the electric chair. Because, yeah. you know, they did the electric chair then. They yeah. don't do that anymore. But, um, yeah, but Ted Bundy got electrocuted. But so I don't know if that's really the case. And he also said, too, and I know this is a lie because the timeline doesn't work out. But he does say that there was a female uh, killer who I can't remember what her what her name was but um but she got executed and it's like oh some of the um the sheriff's guys like at the prison like let us watch them like shave her pussy like before they that didn't happen and i and and then like somebody pointed out like yeah. in the comments it's like um she well, she didn't get executed until after he was already dead yeah, so yeah. what the fuck is he talking about but uh <laughs> but yeah so it's like that kind of stuff he's making shit up so yeah so you can't really tell but i will concede that he obviously killed way more people than the two that he was convicted of. And they know and they're pretty sure, like ninety nine percent sure that he did. But it's like like I said, they didn't and he's dead now, so they can't really And he did actually confess to a lot of them, like in a roundabout way. But yeah, this motherfucker and he was another one too, just like much in the BTK mold, where he was always trying to get into a job where he was like in a position of authority. And this guy actually did become a cop. Matter of fact, that's one of his nicknames is the killer cop. He wasn't a cop for a long time, but he did use his copness as uh, a way to get victims. So there's that. Uh, they also called him the hangman for reasons we'll get into later, which are not pleasant, I must warn you. So yeah, this is, uh, this is kind of a fucked up one. And like I said, I'm kind of wondering why this dude's not better known, you know? Maybe just because he was only convicted of two. But, I mean, the story is really, really fucked up. Matter of fact, like, one of the guys, one of the prosecutors that worked on his case thought he was, he called him this one of the sickest people he'd ever met or one of the most, like, deviant people he'd ever met. So, that's saying something for a Florida prosecutor, I'd imagine. Um, but, yeah, <laughs> Murder Hornet said he probably had sexual problems, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. This, this dude had massive, massive sexual problems. And like I said, similar to the ones that BTK had. Um, we were watching the BTK thing last night, and I realized that he didn't have sex with any... He didn't rape any of those women. No, this guy did. He just strangled them. And I was I was saying to Janice, says, I'd like to see his dick. Why isn't he, why isn't he raping them? You know? I yeah. bet you because it would embarrass I mean, him or something. It's yeah. Gonna, it's going to be like a... It's going to be kind of like a... Like a D'Angelo like situation? A, a Golden State situation. Killer thing? Yeah, I think so. He didn't want to embarrass himself. That's what I'm thinking. Because he just masturbated on them when they were dead. He didn't want them even to see... They didn't even, he didn't want them to see that. Yeah, it's... So there's there's some shit up with him. Yeah, I imagine there is probably right. something. There's more, there. than what, more than what meets the eye there. Um... Camp guy said Randy Kraft used to stuff a sock up their rectums. He supposedly learned to do that as a medic in Vietnam to keep the corpses from leaking. Uh, and Kraft's victims were all male. Yeah, I've heard of that guy. That's another guy we should... Like I said, you never run out of serial killers. I know it's really depressing. 
Mr. 88 said he definitely did kill more than he's officially convicted of having killed. Oh, yeah, big time. Um, like I said, the most official official thing that I've seen just based on missing persons cases and circumstantial evidence and, like, shit they found in his house and stuff like that, they're thinking that the total is probably 28, but it could be much, much higher. So, but like I said, I don't know because of all the boasting that he did and stuff about all the shit about Ted Bundy and... Yeah, because yeah, oh, yeah, he said that he was screaming when they stuffed the cotton balls up his ass and then when they strapped his dick to his leg or something like that. I'm like, I don't know if they do that, but I mean, I don't he's know. He's telling good stories. He's telling good yeah, stories. Yeah, I guess. That's, that's what he's doing. Yeah. yeah. But uh, we were watching um, a BTK one. There's little details that came out, man, and I thought were fucking hilarious. Like, they were interrogating Dennis, and they go, okay, now let's, we need to talk about your male victims. And he's like, male victims? What are you talking about? Well, we have all those photographs of those guys that you tied up and killed. And he goes, with the masks. And he's like, oh, no, that was me. I took those. That was me, that was me dressed up. <laughs> he's yeah. like, a, he's yeah. all proud. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because <laughs> they found all those photographs. Yeah, of, of him yeah. and his and he outfits. Goes, he goes, I got that hole. tripod, and I had that little squeeze ball that hits the, the thing. And boy, I, I really love that. I'd have it, I'd hide it and press and take pictures. He said, so... Be, uh, fucking Dennis is claiming to have invented the selfie. In the... He did kind of come across like that. Yeah, he, he was claiming to invent the selfie. Well, the way he was describing <laughs> <Yeah>. it, <laughs> he was describing it like nobody else had ever heard of yeah. such a thing. Yeah, he had rigged that up. Which, and I'm yeah. just like, ooh, really? Yeah, that's what that fucking thing is for, <laughs> dummy. That's why they make it. It's like you don't have to tell everybody. Yeah. Like I said, you didn't invent the shit. I had the little like, squeeze ball like, hidden. Like, you didn't, couldn't see it. I'd step on it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like the little clicker thing that I have yeah. for my phone camera. Right. You gotta hide that too, but at least that's much. He thought he was a lot more creative than he was. He well, creative. he was definitely thought he was a lot smarter than he was. Yeah. That's for sure. Like the you could tell just like the way he talked. <sighs> yeah. Like he always came across as like real condescending. But it's like that was the funniest thing to, and it will never stop being funny to me that he got caught because he he straight up asked the cops, "Can you trace a floppy disk?" Yeah, and they were like, "No, of course not." And then he, on, and then he was indignant about it. He got him on camera. And goes, "You lied to me." And well, they're why, like, well, "Why'd you lie to me?" Because we're trying to catch you. He's like, "Because I was trying to catch you, Dennis." Yeah, yeah. Duh. We're like not on the same team, bro. <laughs> and it's just the fact that he was just so shocked and indignant by that. It's just like it cracked me. Although up I got a hand in Dennis, he was laughing about it because you know me being a Boy Scout leader, I thought you know, <laughs> I thought they. Uh, I oh, never, and also a I'd serial always, killer. Yeah, I always tell the truth. I never lie. Yeah, okay. That's a bunch yeah. of bullshit right there. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, you were lying to your wife all that time yeah. about what you were up to. Yeah. So, no Boy Scout there. That's when the Minotaur had him. Yeah. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, they didn't bring up the Minotaur <laughs> no, thing. The Minotaur. That's in the book, yeah. but <laughs> it's not. Because a lot of the stuff from the book was in the... Because, like uh, I said, it was the same woman that wrote the book. Yeah. But, um, yeah, they didn't mention... They mentioned cubing and all that kind of stuff, but they didn't mention yeah. that. They mentioned well, Factor we, X, that's what he and called it. what was it? it? He would work himself up into a fluffle? What, what, what did he work himself into? Yeah, what did he, I think he went, meant to say frenzy, but he said frizzy. Fr into a frizzy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he into said he worked himself into a frizzy. Yeah. I was like, like a frizzy perm? <laughs> frizzy, I think that's what he called it, yeah. 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 And like I said, so I don't know if he was trying to say frenzy and he just misspoke and then they... I think it was and a the, term he made up. Maybe. He did kind of do it's that. It's like a sexual frenzy. I think it was, it was fri it's a frizzy. Maybe it feels like bubbles in you or something like, like you know, like... Like a fizzy. Like, like a it's, fizzy. A, it, it's a combination between frenzy and, yeah, and yeah, fizzy. Yeah, like a fizzy. Like yeah. a soda. Something like that, yeah. That's how I'm picturing it. So it's it. like a portmanteau. I'm trying to channel fucking... Dennis. That, you prison. know what? It wouldn't shock me because he That's, did come up with like all these yeah. weird little turns of phrase. and That was one of the weirdest things about like reading his shit like reading his letters yeah. and stuff it's like it almost had to be like decoded because he had all these weird little yeah, d d terms Dennis, for everything Dennis was about emotions and feelings and all just about himself other people didn't exist he was just his own little fantasies and his feelings about them and he's trying to be all helpful in it you know being polite oh hey good afternoon you know just trying to be a great subject you know because you're talking he's talking about himself so, yeah you know. Which is really the only yeah. the only topic that matters. Yeah. At least in his mind. Yeah. He's trying to put his best foot forward. Like I said, when I... Operating with the, with the authorities. When I was researching Gerard Schaefer, just BTK shit kept coming up. Because 
this dude, like I said, is very much a BTK type. A little bit of a Ted Bundy type, too. But, you know, in the sense that... In the sense that he targeted, like... He kind of the same kind of women, and like I said, the whole beheading thing and necrophilia and all that. And he was kind of... Um, Gerard Schaefer was kind of a, an okay-looking dude, and, like, he seemed to come across, like... You know, he had a job, and he's married and shit like that. So it's kind of similar in that way as well. And I want to say he was charming, but he wasn't really. Like, he wasn't overtly a creep, but even back in school, like, some of the girls were like, yeah, he was kind of a creep. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't weird looking or nothing, but he was kind of a creep, like, the way he acted. But I don't know. So, all right. So we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. Mr. 88 said one. What? Yeah, Mr. 88 was going to quote him. One non-official Schaefer victim had been picked up by a guy named Gerard. Her sister was suspicious and wrote down the guy's license plate. Well, that's interesting because, yeah, because one of them's, um, her mom wrote down the license plate. And uh, they and then she went and, like, found the dude's address. But, yeah, we'll talk about that later. Mr. 88 was also saying that, uh, that uh, BTK, uh, he, he only uh, jerked off on one of them. No, it was more than that. If I, I think it was two. I think he yeah. jerked off on Vicky Weggerly, too. When you could, yeah. Because at least they uh, they found the DNA on her, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, and then the little girl that he hung. Yeah, the uh, first uh, one, the Oteros. Yeah, and he he did it when he could, evidently. And there, I don't think there's any proof of some of the other ones because he moved those bodies. So you wouldn't Well, he didn't them. usually. The only yeah. one that he moved was the one that he took to the church, and that okay. was because he wanted to take pictures of her. Yeah, and I don't think there's any proof that he did anything to her. He didn't jerk off to that one. But so, some of the stuff he got interrupted, too, if I remember correctly. Um, so some of them he just had to kill early, didn't he? With, um, uh, a couple of them. Well, it not so much interrupted, but like things like he would plan yeah. stuff and it never it didn't turn out that way. And he was and it was fucked up because he's saying and they're like almost like it's a big joke. Oh, things never went out and went the way yeah. I planned. You know what I mean? Right. Like he would always plan. It's like oh, I had watched this woman for a long time and she lived alone and she was always alone. But then like the one time that he yeah. broke in there, like you know she had a date or her brother was over or something like yeah. that that he wasn't expecting. Right. Um, you know, or there was a dog in the yard that he didn't know about or something. So it's like, like I said, he wasn't as fucking bright as he thought he was, he was not by a long stretch. He, he was, uh, I analyzed what he was doing. He was just making custom bondage porn with dead yeah. bodies. It was like snuff porn. He, yeah. Was, he wanted to get pictures of him looking scared, but I don't think he ever got that. No, what was that? That was that other guy. Um... He wanted to see a certain look on their face. But evidently he didn't bring any cameras with him. I don't know why he didn't. And then um, he took pictures of that one. Yeah. And that was it. And then he took pictures of himself. And he tried to put himself in, in, in the position of the victim. Trying to, like he's buried himself alive and all tied up. He's had bondage fantasies about being tied up. Which, like I said, a lot of people have that. And there's nothing wrong with that. But it's just kind of like, because this guy had the same thing. Uh, and it started young. Like I said, that's another thing that reminded me of BTK. But, um, yeah, Mr. He's more into killing them. Yeah. He, 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 um, he got off on knowing that you're going to die. That's that, that angle. So he was a little kid. He was, when Des was a little kid, they tied him up playing cops and robbers. And he was pretending he was going to die, and that turned him on. Yeah. Because he had the ropes on him, and he, oh, I'm going to die. And that was uh, arousing. Yeah. That's what started it. Which is a little weird, but... And he know. started killing cats, hanging cats, ropes and shit. And, uh, Which, if I had caught him doing that as a kid, I'm yeah. just like, well, we're just going to snuff that kid out yeah. right now. It's evil. Save some... It's uh, a bad sign. Save everybody some trouble later yeah. on. <laughs> because sign. that's going to end badly. Um, but yeah, I just, you know. Because that, that, that just never ends well. Mm. If you have a kid doing that. Kids just don't do that shit. Normal kids don't. You know what I mean? Not like that. Like, yeah, a lot of them will, like, you know, burn ants and shit like that. That's not that big a deal, but the shit that they did, that he did, was... No. That's a completely different thing. Because that's, like, a complete lack of empathy. And a complete um, wish to have control over someone weaker than you. Yeah. Which, like I said, that never bodes well. And, and they don't... I kind of feel like a lot of people don't grow out of that like or don't get out good over that 
that's like a really bad sign. Uh, Mr. 88 said Schaefer does have the Henry Lee Lucas problem in that police likely attribute too many cases to him. But unlike uh, Henry Lee Lucas, Gerard definitely did kill more people. Hard to unravel after the fact. Yeah, um, he definitely did. Yeah, Henry Lee Lucas, like I said, I think he only killed two or three people. Oh, speaking of Henry Lee Lucas, um, at least indirectly, that was another thing that Gerard Schaefer said. He said, because I think he was also in jail with um, Otis Toole, you know, Henry Lee Lucas's bud. And... He said, I saw like some parts, like some uh, clips of some of an interview with Gerard Schaefer, and he said that Otis Toole was his fuckboy in prison. <laughs> and so he had all the dirt on Henry Lee Lucas. Like I said, I don't know if any of this is true Sounds or not. Like true. Or Sounds if like he's all. just, he's yeah, crazy. if he's just like blowing his own horn. Yeah. Because the weird thing about Gerard Schaefer is that not only, and I guess like serial killers are like this, BTK was kind of like this, but I feel like Gerard Schaefer was like, kind of like the epitome of this, where he wanted to be, like, the world's best serial killer. So a lot of the shit that he was talking about, um, like I said, he would name drop, like, more famous serial killers, like, oh, Ted Bun Ted Bundy said he was homaging me, like, with this murder. Like, he totally ripped off my murder. You know what I mean? Like, this, the M.O. He would say shit like that, and he just sounded like a fucking edgelord, is what he sounded like. And he, and he was very big on trying to shock people you know what i mean so and i'm not saying that he didn't kill a bunch of people because i'm certain that he puts he most certainly did but a lot of it might be like 80 to 110 that might be an exaggeration although it wouldn't shock me if it wasn't but i do kind of feel like it might have been an exaggeration because he was very much into which like i said we'll get more into this later but he would write short stories ever since he was young like ever since he was a kid he would write like all these quote-unquote short stories about all of his fantasies and pretty much all of them were violent misogynistic like you know killing women and raping them and cutting their heads off and eating them and shit like that and he wrote shit like that all the time and he would send them to he had an ex-girlfriend like many years later like she had been his boyfriend like they'd been boyfriend and girlfriend in high school and she became a true crime writer later on and they collaborate on a book and he published all his stuff and she, I've seen interviews with her. She's a little bit of a nut, too, because she ended up with, um, she ended up dating Danny Rowling, for Christ's sake, too, like, after, the, you know, the Gainesville Ripper. So she's, like, making her way through all the serial killers, which that's a whole other kettle of fish right there. But, um, but she said, like, in some interviews, she's like, I just got the sense that, not saying that a lot of the stuff in the stories wasn't true or wasn't stuff that he'd really done, because I'm sure it was, but, um... She said, I got the distinct feeling that he was trying to shock me, disgust me. So he was trying to go, like, as far as possible. Like, he just seemed very... And he came across like that in his interviews. Because there are a lot of interviews with him because he liked to talk about himself, just like BTK did. But, um, yeah, so he, so he was just very much the kind of... Uh, I mean, I'll get into, like, some of the shit that he said. And... While I don't doubt that he did do horrible shit, like he said, some of it he might just be exaggerating to sound like a quote-unquote badass. You know what I mean? It, it just kind of gave me a whiff of that as well. Yeah. But he did bad enough shit, like, in real life, but I think he exaggerated some. But... It's kind of like badasses run around doing what these guys do. Yeah, that's what... Sure. See, that... Well, that's what makes me angry about... Like I said... <laughs> He's a chumps, man. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you guys know, it's like, yeah. these are like the worst of the worst. They yeah. fascinate me. But they fascinate me because they're the worst. And I'm just like, what the fuck is wrong with these people? Because it's like, they just, they're just not wired right. You know what I mean? So it's like, so, so that fascinates me. The fact that they're just, that there are humans that are just that deviant that, that would do yeah. that kind of shit. But it was like, so it's bad enough that they do the shit that they do. But then to be like an edge lordy, arrogant douche on top of it, it's just like, that's, that's just kind of like the cherry on the shit Sunday, as far as I'm concerned. You know what I mean? Yeah, the most successful one would be Ted Bundy, and he was weak. I'd fuck that dude up. But he was stronger than a woman. And he used weapons, I believe, too. He used guns on him and shit. Yeah, Knives. this guy did as well. <clears throat> yeah, and then um, D'Angelo probably physically was the closest you could get to a badass. He was doing some pretty hardcore shit, doing stuff, running around in the middle of the night. And in the middle of the day, armed, going into people's houses, setting it up, you know. It was almost kind of like commando raids. But he was trained cop, and I believe he was ex-Army, too, wasn't he? I think he had been in the military, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, either Marine Corps or Army. 
Yeah, I thought he was a Marine, but Marine I could be right. I could be remembering it wrong. So, you know, he had the background and he had the physical strength, you know, and the discipline to be a soldier and a cop. So that'd be the closest you're ever gonna get to a badass would be D'Angelo. D'Angelo was a badass. Don't let him hear that. Yeah, he yeah, but he's <laughs> old now. He was evil. Real, the, real yeah, the, the the stupid thing about it, and it, this just kind of applies across the board, not just to serial killers, but any time that you're a serial killer or any kind of criminal like that, and you're talking about what a badass you are, and basically you're just tying up and raping and killing teenage girls. Yeah. That, yeah. How much of a badass not, can you really yeah, be? Yeah, killing those, killing those people isn't what made D'Angelo a badass, though. What made D'Angelo a badass is that he actually had physical strength enough to fight men and uh, he could pass oh he was navy he was navy navy okay he could he could pass law enforcement training he had balls that he was evil you know what i mean his motives were cowardly yeah you know he didn't go up against other armed men yeah you know? which why didn't they do that yeah why don't you just do that and then put it on sex with them. and then put it on pay-per-view <laughs> and then we can yeah. all watch y'all kill each other yeah everyone's a winner but um, you know, what I it's mean? only fun when the other guys are armed, or fucking can't, can't hurt you. That's like a duel, right? That's everybody's what I mean. everybody. It's if, if if it's too much in your favor, then that's 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 no thrill. Everyone's fucking name's got to be on the menu. Death's got to be equal opportunity. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, even what's his name? Fucking Mark Twain said, "Fucking once you teach young men how to hunt and kill each other armed men, they never really get out of it." They you know, nothing's ever really the same. They like that. But I don't, I don't remember which war he was talking about. But uh, that's where a lot of those cowboys and a lot of those mercenaries and shit over the years and Pinkertons and shit fucking they came from that kind of a background. World War Two guys. They were badasses when they came home. Mister Eighty Eight said Pansram is the guy that walked the walk. No administration. Yeah, Pansram. Yeah. That dude was a lunatic. He wasn't really a human though. He was more like a devil. A demon from the bowels of hell. He was created in hell. In those fucking orphanages. He is probably one of... We've done a show about him, but he's probably one of the most extreme cases that I've ever read. The dude was just... He had absolutely no humanity. No. Whatsoever. No. And uh, making... I don't even want to call him an animal because that's an insult to animals. It was a weird thing about him is that he had no interest in women. He just wanted to rape men and make other men rape other men and shoot guys if they didn't have sex and the motherfucker was a nut. A nut. Yeah, he was a complete lunatic. Didn't go after little girls, just men and boys. A complete lunatic. Yeah. Like I said, I think he had, of all the... He hated men. ...killers that we've talked about, yeah. I think he had, like, the least humanity. I don't yeah. even think he was human at all anymore. I don't know how physically strong he was. I've only seen pictures of his face and stuff, but in those days, most people were pretty scrawny. It was fucking poverty, depression and shit. You could tell he was a lunatic just by looking at his He's fucking face. Like, looking at his eyes, there was just nothing in there. He just seemed completely, like, soulless, you know what I mean? And I'm just using that as a term. I don't really believe in souls, but you know what I mean. I do. I know you do. Yeah. I'm just saying that, I'm just using it in the kind of more... He was a demon. ...colloquial sense. He was created as a demon. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, we and we talk about this a lot because I'm kind of fascinated by the whole nature-nurture thing. I mean, with the particular case of Pansram... Yes, he had a horrible upbringing, a horrible upbringing, like an unimaginably horrible upbringing. But the thing about it was that, you know, and I'm not diminishing it. I'm just saying that a lot of other boys had that same upbringing and didn't turn out like that. It was just how he reacted. So there has to be another factor, you know, there has to be another factor. Well, there's always just going to be variations in, in, in results. You beat nine dogs that way. Not all the dogs will turn out the same way. He was just one that didn't turn out like the other ones. Yeah. You know. Because, you know, everyone's different, and you never know how one person's going to react. Because the thing about, and you know, to kind of circle back around to this motherfucker that we're talking about, Gerard Schaefer, he had a pretty... I don't know if I'd say normal childhood, but not that abnormal. And I feel like BTK was the same. Like, he had a pretty... Just normal, nothing, no real like egregious abuse or anything like that. There was really no indication um, that 
anything would go awry necessarily. Um, you know, like I said, it wasn't a fantastic childhood, but it was just like, you know, it was just pretty average for the time, I would imagine. So it's not always, sometimes people are just fucked up, you know. Mr. 88 said Panzeram was ripped. I had to go back to see him. Yeah, it said he was completely honest about what made him him. Yeah, he was. He was. I mean, for somebody as monstrous as he was, he did seem to have something of an insight about why he was monstrous. Yeah, he didn't care, though. No, but yeah, but he didn't care. Because usually if people are that insightful, that interest, you know, they have some introspection, they don't turn out like that, but... Ha- hatred for men. Yeah. And people in general. Because a lot of times, I think a lot of the problem, too, is that, and you can see this in a lot of serial killer interviews, some of them do seem to have some insight about what they do, but a lot of times I find that when they're talking, sometimes they reveal a lot more than they think they're revealing by, like, the way that they say things. But because the thing about it is that a lot of them think that they're smarter than everyone else, so they don't realize that other people can kind of, like, see through them sometimes. I think BTK had that problem. Um, you know, some of the shit that he says, I don't, I don't know that he realizes what exactly it is that he's saying or that he's revealing. You see BTK, you see him, uh, pictures of him when he was uh, basically arrested, you know, or, and going through trial. He looks pretty fucking bad. You see, when he was young, B- uh, uh, fucking Dennis was actually a good-looking guy. His wife and his daughter were good-looking. Yeah, when, he, when I saw his daughter, I was like, man, I, I couldn't believe it. You know, she first of all, she's normal. Yeah. And uh, she was cute. I mean, she's still normal. Yeah. I saw some interviews with her and stuff like that. Yeah. I can't imagine what that must be like. Yeah. But she, I mean, the wife never did come out, and I can't really fucking blame her, to be honest. Um <laughs> The, the wife was just like, yeah, I'm not, I don't want any part of that. I'm they just, didn't you know. know. No, they didn't. Yeah. They didn't. I mean, yeah, they were completely, completely shocked. You know what I'm saying? This motherfucker had a, um, Gerard Schaefer, he had a wife as well. Well, he married a couple times. He didn't have any kids, though. Yeah, Camp Guy's right. Panzeram wasn't a normal serial killer. He'd fight you at a bar and kill you if you looked yeah. the wrong way. Yeah. Panzeram was almost kind of like a damn Old West gunfighter. He kind of had that, because that, that was 1920, so it was almost the same era. Kind of like an old west gunfighter that had been perverted into a, a homosexual serial rapist and murderer. You know. Yeah, he was just mean. a fucking. He was a mean he came, he bastard. Up, he was he just came, like a mental yeah, case. Yeah, he came up out of. Uh, if you guys don't haven't seen a pro- show, we did a whole show on him. He was basically raised in orphanages, just being sexually abused by the staff and the other fucking inmates that were there, or the kids that were there, and he just fucking grew up just being evil, just totally. And he was going through prisons and prisons also and every time he'd get out of prison he'd fucking do worse and worse shit and you know he killed little boys and men and bums make bums have sex with each other and then kill them and fucking uh, he's fucking evil take little boys out on a boat and fucking rape them drown them throw them overboard I think I think he threw them overboard and weights on them didn't he uh, if I remember Or you right. shoot him, I don't remember. <clears throat> Mr. 88 about said... little boys, like 10-year-olds, like 9-year-olds. Yeah. Like that. You know, he was, he was vicious. Mr. 88 said, BTK is also distinctly not all that bright. Yeah, yeah. that was one thing that I did note um, when I was reading a lot of his stuff, like a lot of his interviews and stuff like that. He clearly thinks he's a fucking genius. Yeah, but he's very average until... But he's really not all that yeah, smart. Yeah, very average, if not uh, below average a little bit. Yeah. Yeah, he's just methodical. He liked to order. He was that, yeah. Um, he did fuck up though, yeah. like a lot of times. But yeah, he was like real anal retentive about uh, planning shit. I think he was probably about average, maybe a little bit above average intelligence. Now that I think about it, just that he wasn't creative. He was. He's but boxed in. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean. Kind of conformist in a way. <laughs> yeah, big time. <coughs> Which is why he liked so much that whole authoritarian. Yeah. mindset and I think it's interesting because Catherine Ramsland said on there and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember the exact wording that she used but she said that he um, liked everything very regimented so that he could go in there and basically just like break the rules yeah. like nobody else was allowed to he wanted you to follow the rules so he could go in there and break so he could go in there and take advantage of you yeah. like that's basically what I don't know if he would have enough insight to realize that but she realized that 
No, no, he said he was always going in and out of the mode. Right. He'd be a normal guy, and then he'd become like like the, the X Factor. He'd become a, a Minotaur. And then he'd get he'd walk away from it for a few years, and then go back to it. Sometimes he didn't have time, you know, to do it. Yeah, because sometimes he got busy doing other yeah, things. Right. He had his motel parties and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, if you have Hulu, yeah, that's another thing I forgot about that. Yeah. I didn't know about. It. Fucking Dennis would have motel parties. And you're like, well, who's coming to this fucking party? Just just him. He'd rent a room to do his fucking thing and just and jerk it. And, yeah. and, and, and dress he had to up have a hole. and tie himself up. And, and, he, and he'd, he'd be there for like a couple days doing that. The vacation with himself. And his suitcase full of stuff. Six suitcase full of fucking... Masks and rope and stuff. Masks and with makeup on them and lingerie <laughs> which like i said look that would be fine if that was all you were doing if you weren't hurting anybody no that one would care the victim's lingerie though wouldn't it yeah it that's was, the thing yeah, well like sorry. i said if you just went out and bought your yeah. own lingerie and wanted to tie yourself up and put a mask on like you know knock yourself out you're not hurting anybody he had a whole but, treasure map with dozens and dozens of little stash points where he was stashing all his yeah, trophies that was another thing they showed yeah. on his fucking and abandoned vehicles out in fucking out in the woods and stuff crazy yeah crazy he called them hidey holes yeah he's so it's funny because he's so fucking in some in many ways he's so midwestern mm -hmm. like i i commented at one point where we're watching the show um like the whole entire time that he's talking i was like you know he'll murder people but he won't swear right yeah <laughs> it was just like so weird to me yeah like, because I think he used some word like he was like, gosh, blah, blah, yeah. blah. And I was just yeah. like, oh. Yeah, he'd say G. Will that motherfuckers kind of do say G. Willikers. Right. Yeah. Golly. But he's a fucking serial killer. Yeah, and golly. then he can't even say, god damn it. Gosh. Or shit. I was yeah. just. So that's why I don't trust people that don't swear. I don't. <laughs> I was like, what else have you got going on that that's like covering up? Because that's like, I don't know. I just, I just don't, I don't know. I don't know what that is, what it is, but uh, all right. So, <laughs> yeah, Mister Eighty Eight said Dennis also almost fatally hung himself on a scout camp out. He couldn't get out of his own noose. Yeah, too bad that didn't happen earlier. But, but yeah, he's still alive too, and he. I, I think I say that every time. Is he dead yet? <laughs> no. All right. So let's start talking about Gerard Shaper. We'll probably talk more about BTK too, just because we watched that too, and I was like, these dudes are really kind of similar. Yeah. Even though this this dude is a Florida man, he wasn't born in Florida. He was actually born in Wisconsin, but he moved to Florida when he was a teenager. So yeah, so this motherfucker, uh, Gerard Schaefer. One uh, documentary I said said that he usually went by his middle name, which was John. But I only saw one documentary that said that, so I'm just gonna call him Gerard because that's his fucking name, and he's dead, and he can't do anything about it. So um, so he's born in 1946, like I said, in Wisconsin. Now he was. Um, the oldest of his parents' children, uh, he, he had like two, he had a sister, a sister and a brother or two sisters, I can't remember. So his dad was actually a traveling salesman. So he was gone a lot. Now, as I mentioned, it wasn't a great childhood, but it wasn't like a crazy, like over the top sexual abuse kind of thing. Now I will note that the dad, um, he, you know, like I said, he was gone a lot, uh, allegedly had a bunch of affairs, like while he was out on the road and stuff. And he was also an alcoholic. So he did kind of beat on the mom, uh, I believe, who was a housewife. And they moved around a lot. So they ended up in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, in 1960. Now, one of the things that Gerard Schaefer said about his childhood was that he felt neglected by his father. Like, he felt like his father didn't really give a shit about him, or he was, like, the redheaded stepchild. He called himself, like... He called himself something like the illegitimate product of a shotgun wedding or something like that. Like, implying that, I guess, his... You know, his mom got pregnant and then they had to get married because it was back in the 40s. Um, I don't know if that's the case or not, but that was how he perceived it. So... It seemed like he was always, I don't even know if he was even trying to please his dad, but he always felt like his dad didn't really give a shit about him and always like favored his sister. 
Now, the fact that the dad favored the sister, some people have speculated that this is what first got Gerard into um, wearing women's clothing because he, much like BTK, he was really into women's underwear. Like, he would go and steal girls' underwear and shit like that. So he was, like, that kind of person. And he started to get, like, a sexual charge out of that, like, from a pretty young age, evidently. He also said that whenever him and his siblings were playing games as kids that he always wanted to be the per like if they were play acting games like cops and robbers and stuff he always wanted to be the person to get killed so he might have been having like some i don't know suicidal ideation or something like that like from a fairly young age like i said mostly because you know they're moving around a lot his dad's kind of a drunk who kind of beats up on the mom his dad's not really paying attention to him the only things that him and his dad had in common were a love for hunting and fishing and so every now and then they would go out and do that together, you know what I mean? But he did feel like his dad kind of like belittled him all the time. So he was actually much closer to his mom. That's, again, you don't see that across the board in serial killers, but it is very common for people that later become serial killers to have like real either neglectful or super, super authoritarian or abusive fathers and real overprotective mothers. That's a pretty common family dynamic and that seems to be the case here so like i said uh as he is getting a little bit older he was really into hunting and fishing he kind of liked being out in the woods sort of by himself i don't think he was necessarily a loner like he did have friends kind of but he wasn't real he was kind of more a dude that sort of like faded into the background a little bit i guess so more more than like he didn't really stick out like in one way or the other i guess now as he got a little bit older like in, as a teenager as i mentioned this might be a little bit because of the way that his dad favored his sister and he was like thinking oh if i was a girl my dad would like me better or something like that but he started having sexual fantasies where um he would do like peeping tom kind of shit and he started having um like just real violent fantasies about um, you know, hurting women. And again, like a lot of male serial killers, he had a very distinct Madonna horror complex. Uh, and he, as he got older, he would off, he just basically would call girls sluts, whores, and they, you know, they would get what was coming to them and shit like that. One story in particular that, um, one of his childhood or teenage friends remembered about him was that he had a neighbor, like when he was a teenager, who was about the same age as him. And he believed that she was taunting him by undressing in her room, like where he could see her, like from the window. Like he thought that she was doing it on purpose, like to tease him. And he was really, really angry about this and thought that she deserved to be punished for it for tempting him or like being a whore that was like yeah how he thought of shit and like i said this is when he was still pretty young you know what i mean and i think too when he was a teenager he started getting into pretty extreme i guess like sexual fantasies and i don't think he was very old either according to a couple of documentaries that i saw he apparently had a girlfriend when he was 14 they were both 14 and I, they were together for like two or three years. And either at his behest or because she was into this, which it's a 14-year-old girl, I, I don't really know, but it's possible, I guess. Um, they would get real into like violent rape fantasies. And these are 14-year-old, like 14 to 17-year-old teenagers. So that should tell you something right there. Like I said, I kind of think... I think he kind of tried to claim later that it was all her idea, like that it was what she was into, and so he was doing it, but given his proclivities later on, I probably feel like it was probably his idea. But yeah, so much like BTK, um, he got into wearing women's clothing, he got into doing um, autoerotic asphyxia, and he was also real into <clears throat> like going out in the woods and tying himself to trees. <clears throat> and you know that would like make him bust a nut you know what i mean 
tying himself to trees and doing and imagining doing that to somebody else. Well, it's uh, logical. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, and another thing too, like like I said, in school he wasn't considered. He didn't really stand out, although one girl that had gone to high school with him she's like she did remember she's like he didn't really hang out with any of the cliques like any of the guys or anything like that um the one thing that she mainly remembered and i think that a lot of girls that he went to high school with remembered him for this too it's like that all the girls knew that if he like walked by or something that you had to like put your skirt down like that because he would like was real into like looking up girls skirts and stuff so they thought he was like a pervert like a like a creep and that was in high school now, he, like I said, he wasn't a loner or a loser or anything like that. He was actually, um, his teachers seemed to like him, thought he was going to go places. Like, he wasn't an amazing student, but he was, like, a real good, he was a good student. Um, he was on the varsity football team, um, and he was, uh, he did golf. Like, he played golf, and he was really, really good at it. Some, like, sources I saw said he was good enough to go pro, which I don't know if that's true or not. So he actually, um, I think this was a Catholic high school he went to, to uh, St. Thomas Aquinas High School, because his family was uh, Catholic. So he actually graduated from a Catholic high school in 1964, and then uh, went on for a little while to work as a fishing guide in the Everglades. And then he um, got, went and enrolled at Broward Community College. Now his first major was social studies, but then he decided to go into education. He wanted to get his teaching certificate. Now, see, like I said, this is, again, much like BTK, much like these types of serial killers, they always like to be in a position of authority or power over other people. So um, teaching would have appealed to him, I guess, because he could, you know, have authority over other people, and that's what he wanted. So he did okay uh, in the education program. And then he actually got a scholarship for his remaining like two years to go to Florida Atlantic University. That's in Boca Raton. Now, so he does that. Now during this time, like while he was, while he was still in college or a little bit after, he actually married his first wife, whose name was Marty Fogg. She was a, a student also, and she was two years younger than him. Now weirdly, she, <laughs> I just thought this was a weird detail. She was actually in a singing group. Cause you know, this was like, right. This was right around like 1968. So it's kind of like the height of the hippie movement. Right. So I guess from my understanding that there was like a counter movement among like, I guess like real religious or like super conservative people where it's like, we're going to have our own singing group, like to counteract the hippie shit. So I guess that the, woman that he married the girl that he married was in that so he actually toured with that with this singing group for a while like going around doing these kind of like i don't know if they were anti-hippie songs but they were trying to like counter the whole hippie message i guess so yeah so they did that so um these two did not stay married very long the problem seems to have arisen because one uh gerard was gone all the time so he was hunting and then when he was home all he wanted to he, he wanted to have like rough sex and she wasn't into it so um i guess like he had all these kind of things where it's like well you have to put out you have to do what i say you have to do this and the other thing because like i said he seemed like a very controlling dude dude had rules man <laughs> he had rules <laughs> <laughs> yeah well she didn't like the rules um so after a while she divorced him and the reason that she gave on the divorce papers was quote unquote extreme cruelty so i don't know exactly what that meant but i can probably i can imagine oh some sexual shit probably yeah well this he is going up in here I don't, I don't care what you say about it. this. Shit's well, he might have been. Be, I mean, like I said, but considering like the shit that he did later on, he probably wanted to like fucking. Right. It's like uh, we're gonna get that up in there somehow. Right. It was probably some shit like that. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. Uh, like I said, imagine like just considering what he would do later on. Yeah. I imagine he probably wanted to tie her up and do like. Well, like I said, his. I don't know if you were here when I was talking about it, but his one of his teenage girlfriends like when he was 14 to 17 
they were all in off into like rape fantasies. Yeah. So I'm assuming that he wanted to do some shit like that. And the she's girl like, was into it too. Well, or that's what he it. said, yeah, but right. I kind of suspect that that is not the case. So that might have been what was going on here. And she's like, "Yeah, bro, I'm not. I don't really like that." Yeah. Um. Okay. So then, this is crazy. Like considering what what happened later. March of 1969, he actually gets an internship, like a teaching internship at Plantation High School. And he first starts out teaching geography. Now, he was only a teacher at this place for, like, less than two months. Because it turned out that he was um, just super arrogant, super aggressive, um, he wouldn't listen to anything that his superiors told him. Like I said, he was just an intern. He was just out of college, you know what I mean? And um, he was attempting to uh, force his own questionable morals on the students. Yeah. And there were many, many complaints. I don't know exactly what he was saying, but it was apparently not good because a lot of the, the parents uh, of shit like that uh, were complaining. So, Victor um, Garcia is in there. Hey, Victor, Victor. Victor's showing up. He's, <laughs> he's here to tell us what turned him gay. We'll find out this episode. He's always got a different excuse. Yeah, I'm gonna use something. Yeah. Liking booty's got nothing to do with it, huh, Victor? All right. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so yeah, basically, the guy, after they fired him from that position, um, the guy that had hired him was like, yeah, that was a big fucking mistake. And he, what the hell? The dog. Oh, right? okay. It's I never a little him. yappy dog. A little yappy dog outside. I didn't yeah. know what that noise was. But the guy that, um, hired him and then subsequently fired him was basically like, um, and this, so this guy must've been bad if, even from this early, early stage, because he's like, um, if I ever hear that this guy is put in a position of authority over anyone, like, I want to hear about it so I can put a stop to it. And I was like, damn. Is she in the... Oh. She's, Somebody's going in the litter she's box. She's in the litter box. Which guy is it? It must be, it must be Dakota. Because I, th I don't think Pookie uses that one. She uses the downstairs one. Good girl. Good girl. <laughs> she's in there. It's Dakota. She's making a huge, yeah. she's making a huge racket in the yeah. litter box just for some That's reason. What she does? Yeah. Well, okay, I thought. So now I, we know. I thought so. You only had to show her to her once, and she knew right where to go. And she's like, "Oh, okay." Yeah. Yeah. We didn't put this one up there, so because I didn't want her to yeah. have to use the same one as Pookie, because I thought yeah. they would be, they would fight over it. Um. But yeah. So then, after he gets fired, he applies for another student uh, teaching position. Um. But they didn't give it to him. However, four months after that. Uh, he actually did get another teaching internship at a different school. So he started teaching geography again at Stranahan High School. Um, and this place also, after a short time, was like, man, this dude sucks. Like, he didn't... They said he had very limited knowledge of the subject that he was teaching, which was geography. He's like, where is this? Are we in the United States? What country is this? <laughs> you know what I mean? It was... I don't know if it was that bad. Um... And they also said that he was uh, very arrogant. And so, basically, they're like, what? Victor Garcia, he answered. I narrowed it down to early 90s Keanu Reeves is what made me gay. <laughs> That's a hell of a man. Now we know. <laughs> That's a hell of a man. Dude could shoot, man. He could shoot. I've seen him at the range. And he could ride motorcycles. Knows all about motorcycles. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. That dude's a good... He, he's good shot, man. I've seen him shoot live, live ammunition. AR-15s, fucking pistols, everything. It's never going to be like, you know, that movie that he did. Those movies, but... John Wick. Yeah, John Wick. That's unrealistic shit, but... Awful cool that motherfucker can shoot. So I will hand it to that. Yeah, that, that's what made you gay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so yeah, so this motherfucker gets fired from another teaching position for essentially the same reasons. And then he goes, allegedly, over to... And I don't know if this was... I guess this wasn't with the singing group, because I think this was after his divorce. But he actually went to Europe in North Africa for a little while. Like, not long. But then he came back to Florida. And then he started working as a security guard a little bit. Again, there's that authority thing. 
And he actually um, decided that he wanted to be a cop. So, again, much like BTK, uh, wanted to be in authority over people, tell other people what to do, have yeah. power over other people. Very, very common in these types of killers. So there was a open position at the Wilton Manors Police Department, which is actually, um, which is just like a suburb of Fort Lauderdale, I think, which is in South Florida, in case you didn't know. Um, so it's like a small, it's not a huge crime place or anything like that. So um, he goes and applies there, and on his application, he does not tell them that he had been fired from the two teaching positions earlier. Uh, so he basically made up the job that he'd been doing. I was like, oh yeah, I'm a research assistant at Florida Atlantic University. Like he did go to that university, but he wasn't a research assistant. He just went there to teach and they were like, yeah, you're fired. Um, so yeah, they didn't uh, check. So, you know, that was their first mistake. And so he actually got into the Broward County Police Department. That was September of 1971. And um, he went to the little patrolman school and all that other kind of shit and uh, graduated from there. So he was 25 years old at this point. This is Broward? Broward County, yeah. Yeah. So uh, at this point, like I said, his earlier wife had divorced him because of cruelty. Now, before he started working as a police officer uh, in early 1971, he actually met a woman named Teresa Dean. This is when he was still working as a security guard. She was 19 at the time, and uh, they got married that year. Um, now, apparently, this marriage went a lot better because this was a lot more submissive woman, and she would do whatever he said, which apparently that's what he wanted. That made him happy, so you know. Now... This dude, so Schaefer only worked for Wilton Manors, the police department, for only six months. He actually got a commendation. Like, they did a big, like, drug raid or, like, a drug bust or something like that. And he apparently did something, like, cool or hot shit, like, during that. So he got, like, a commendation for that. But literally a month later, he got fired. Um, because what they discovered that he was doing was that he would pull over... Uh, female drivers uh, and then he would get all their information look up their information and then later call them up for dates <laughs> damn which uh, you know you're here. not really supposed to do yeah. that <laughs> you know uh, for the obvious reasons so they found out that he was doing that um, and they fired him now <laughs> so he actually got into you would think they didn't really check back then i guess it was the 70s they didn't have the internet and everything but still it's like how these people just fail upward like this is mind-blowing so he actually got another job as a deputy and this is with the martin county sheriff's department and he got this job in june of 1972 and what he did was he forged a glowing recommendation letter from the last police place where he were who had fired him for being a fuck up but he forged it, and nobody checked. So they gave him a job. He knew um, what he was doing. Yeah. Well, I guess they figured, yeah, who would forge a shit from a fucking other police shot? You know what I mean? Who would have the audacity to forge a recommendation from a police department? Him. Yeah. And it worked. But they would, yeah, that's why it worked. They didn't think he had I, Maybe, I kind of feel like maybe people were a lot more trusting back then. Well, I, well, I was kind of... Um, thinking about that earlier because you know a lot of the some of the women that he killed like he got them when they were hitchhiking which we'll get into in a, in a second but um and i've written about a lot of serial killers who picked up people just because in the 60s and 70s like nobody gave it a second thought like nowadays yeah. everybody'd be fucking horrified like no way am i fucking doing that jesus christ i heard a story of a guy who was a con man while he was in prison he's got his hands on all these damn medical manuals and learned everything about medicine we got out of prison forged up a bunch of shit and got a job as a doctor in a hospital and, and fucking practiced yeah for many years before they caught him dude it was doing surgery it happens for the first time he's doing surgery well frank him. abagnale if yeah. you've read the book catch me if you can he yeah. did that shit too and yeah. he flew airplanes yeah like jet airplanes like you know yeah. like commercial jet jets yeah, shit like that, and he did surgery. He just learned it, learned it on the on the fly, yeah. on the job. 
but, just because um, he was ball. He he started just doing check fraud is what he was doing. Yeah. But he would just go in and say he was all. I wanted to do. I've been wanting to do a show about that guy for a long yeah. time because I read his book. He's fascinating. But if I remember correctly, the guy who got the job at the hospital, and he was in charge of other doctors too. Mm-hmm. Eventually, um, just wrote up a fucking fantastic resume, claiming to come from fucking fantastic schools and all kinds of shit, and they didn't check. Yeah. Because they would. I guess they thought. How could you lie about this? You know, how could you lie about being a fucking nowadays? A they heart absolutely surgeon? will check. <laughs> yeah. Could you imagine that dude the first time he had to do a heart surgery, and never yeah. had any experience? He's just doing it because he read about it. Can you imagine being <laughs> that patient and yeah, and knowing that or like finding that yeah, out later? He read about it and knew and knew all the shit. And I guess the nurses did all most of it. You know, all the prep work and everything and. And evidently he had a reputation of being a good doctor. Isn't that funny? That was back in, I think, in the 80s or the 90s. I mean, sometimes... He had a real good reputation. He, 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 wasn't, he wasn't doing anything criminal other than practicing without a license and lying. Well, that, like that is criminal. But, you know, yeah, it's criminal. But I'm just saying, he really was working. Yeah. You know, it's not like he wasn't, like he was stealing the money or anything. He was, he was doing it. Yeah, that's true. It's not like he was just like, yeah. I'll be in the break room. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> he's just or sitting like, there Bye-bye. drinking, he show up. drinking coffee. And he, doesn't, and he doesn't show up for the surgeries. And he was working. Right. He was doing the job. Camp guy said delivering a baby might be one of the easier things to do if you don't have any complications. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, if you do have complications, you better know what to do because that would. But you know what I mean. I wouldn't risk it, but you know, I'm not. I'm not an arrogant son of a bitch like a lot of these yeah. dudes are, where they're just like, oh yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Dude picked a specialty and learned all about it and went out and did it. Which, like I said, you know, at least he put in the effort. Yeah. So. They said he could talk the lingo. Like I said, he... it's not like he was just trying to fake his way through shit. Yeah. He did other actually. Doctors said they had, said he did that, actually learn yeah, to do he learned it. Yeah. So. The doctor says, yeah, he was a doctor. Yeah. He could do it. Well, but I mean, that's help. how they learn shit, too. Yeah. I mean, they got to learn shit from books. And, I yeah. mean, they get to, like, cut yeah. up on corpses and stuff, yeah, he which he probably didn't, didn't get to do. But go to med school. Yeah. He just read about it and did it. I got a respect for that, man. He's like, well, like I said. Passed himself off as the real. Okay, this gets me back to another fucking story that's like this. We had a guy in the 101st who he had a brother. It was a younger brother. He didn't know it, but his brother stole his ID and used his ID and his social security card, his social security number, and his name to enlist into a reserve airborne unit. It was, I think it was the one, 163rd. He was doing training jumps, firing weapons, jumping out of airplanes on his brother's ID. He had never been to airborne school. He had never gotten, never been to basic training. He wasn't a soldier. But he'd heard about it from his brother. And then just read about it. And then took his brother's social security number and ID and went. And and so he, they figured it out eventually because paychecks were being paid to an active guy and a reservist that had the same social security number. So they did an investigation and found out they were brothers. That's weird, huh? Could you imagine never jumping out of an airplane before and having no training to do it and just faking it and, and doing it and jumping out? I wouldn't even jump out yeah. ever for any reason. <laughs> so, no, I can't imagine that. Fuck yeah. that. Yeah. That's a trip. Yeah, Camp Guy is talking about, uh, talking about birth. Yeah, they cut the vagina at the bottom sometimes to give the baby more room to get out. Yeah, they do. Uh, they do that in a lot of cases, actually. Yeah, sew it back up, though, don't they? Well, yeah, they're yeah, not going to yeah. leave it like that. Yeah. But I know just... they might fucking gr- might heal on its own. Mm, yeah. No. Uh, Mr. 88 said, My eldest son was delivered by a C-section, but the anesthesia completely missed. However, my wife would, wouldn't let them put her under until she heard our son cry. That's hardcore. That's hardcore. But yeah, they do. I, I don't know how, uh, how common it is, but I think it's very, very common that they cut the vagina open. Because so pretty much everybody I know that's had a baby had to have their shit sewn back up. So, yeah. Not fun. Glad I never went through that bullshit. So, uh, so yeah. All right. Now, now we're getting into the abductions. Now, 
the thing about this motherfucker is that no one's entirely sure because they don't know how many people he killed. So they don't actually know when he started killing. So usually when people talk about this case and when I'm talking about this case, it's easier just to start from here because this is kind of the first egregious thing that he did and he got caught. And then like later on they kind of went and then he did some shit after this, which there's a whole situation about that, which we'll get into, but he might've done a bunch of shit before this too, but they didn't find out until later on. And they still actually haven't found a lot of the bodies either. So there's that. But this is how he ended up getting caught. So we don't actually know how much shit he did before this. So this happened on July 21st, 1972. So Gerard Schaefer sees two teenage girls hitchhiking. Their names are Nancy Trotter, she's 18, and Paula Wells, they are 17. Now they're actually not from Florida. Um, they had come here on vacation and they were just like, you know, hang, they were staying with a friend or something and they were just like going to the beach and shit like that, like you do when you come to Florida. Now he was on duty that this day. So he had his uniform and the police car and everything. So he pulls up to them. They were coming back from the beach. And he's basically like, you know, hitchhiking is very dangerous, especially with assholes like me on the road. <laughs> that should have been the end of that sentence. But um, he's like, you know, hitchhiking is very dangerous and you shouldn't do it. He actually told them that it was illegal in Stewart, Florida, where they were, which it is not technically, or it wasn't then. I don't know about now. Um, but he told them that it was illegal and they did, they weren't from here, so they didn't know any better. And he's like, um, I'll tell you what, the, um, they said something about they were going back to the beach the next day. And he's like, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a ride, you know, back to your friend's house now. Just so you're not hitchhiking, so you'll be safe, because I'm a cop. And tomorrow, I'll pick you up and take you to the beach, so you don't have to hitchhike again tomorrow. Now, the girls, like I said, this is the 70s. A lot of people hitchhiked. You know, they're teenagers. And he's a cop, so they're probably thinking, oh, it's fine. It was not fine, but, we'll, yeah, we'll get into that. So he's like, yeah, I'll pick you up tomorrow and take you to the beach. And they were like, okay, that would be cool. So the following day, he had arranged to meet them at this like bandstand or something like that, like at nine in the morning. So the girls are there waiting for him and he shows up. Only today he's in regular ass clothes and in his regular ass car, which is like a bluish green Datsun that he had. And they're like, bro, where's, you know, where's your cop car? Oh, I'm working undercover today, he told them. So he just has his regular clothes on. And that's why he's driving his regular vehicle. Um, so yeah, but so you're still, it's all good. So the two of them get in the car. And then he says to them, oh, you know, you guys are tourists here, so you should see some cool shit, like in Florida. Back here in these woods or whatever, there's this really cool, like, old Spanish fort. Like, we should go look at it. Like, uh, it's on, uh, near Hutchinson Island. And they're like, um, yeah, sure. Okay. That sounds cool or whatever. And then he starts, then it starts getting a little bit weird. Like they take him, take, take them to this place. And it's just like this old shack or whatever. And then he starts saying stuff about, um, them getting sold into white slavery. Okay. Yeah. So there's that. And, um, and then, you know, shit starts getting, like, really threatening. So he, like, takes them out into the woods. And then he put handcuffs on them and gags. Then he took them to this place where these, like, big um, cypress trees or mangrove trees that have, like... If, Jesus Christ. This is fucking loud outside. Yeah. Um, they have those big roots that are, like, above ground. You know what I mean? If you haven't seen those. And he would put nooses around their necks. This is why they call them the hangman. And he would make them like balance on this um, root of the tree. So like if they tried to get out or they tried to, if they slipped off, they would hang. You know what I mean? Like he engineered it so that would happen. So that they couldn't really move around. Like, so he set it up like that. So, and like he had their hands cuffed behind their back and he tied their feet together and shit like that. So you just had to kind of like stand there. How old were these girls again? 17 and 18. Okay. 17 and 18. Um, and then once they were both tied up, he basically 
started saying what he was going to do to them that he was gonna rape and murder them and like he was gonna which one am i gonna do first and like one of you is gonna have to watch or he's gonna make them pick like which one gets killed first that was a big thing that how he did was they pick into he was just really into because like i said how did you get him to pick by basically well what do you mean because you guys pick which one's first how yeah he just makes them pick yeah and they come up with it yeah okay he gets off on... But he had to force him to pick. He gets off on one of them. Like He yeah. basically said something, and like I said, I think I have the exact quote, but it's like further down in my notes somewhere. But um, he's basically saying, I really... And he really enjoyed, like, watching, quote-unquote, best friends, like, turn on each other. Like, kill her first, you know what I mean? Uh, okay. Like, I don't know if that really happened yeah. or not, but he really got into yeah. that. Kind of like Dean Coral getting brothers to turn on each other yeah so that was again that was kind of like another thing of his power yeah oh another thing too that i didn't bring up and a lot of documentaries don't mention this but i did like read a lot of his um letters and their like stuff that he wrote and shit like that one of the things that he liked best about hanging was he was fascinated by basically if you ha- if you hang someone and they piss themselves and shit themselves yeah like he he really got off on that and like a lot of the gross like drawings that he did which are online if you want to look at them but a lot of them had that like that he would have like women and they were usually headless then they would be like hanging from a tree or something like that and they'd be like they'd be like pissing and shitting themselves because he was like really into that I've seen a lot of ha- I've seen hanged bodies, like from the old west. I didn't notice anything like that in them. He's probably making that up. Well, I don't know. I've heard I've heard that it does happen sometimes. It does happen. Yeah, it depends on what they have. But he was real into. Well, yeah, that's what he said. He'd make them drink all this water like oh, yeah, before right. he killed them because he really got off on, on that. Uh, what well, Tom Campbell said: the new backdrop looks good, spooky. Thank okay. you. Like I said, it's old. We just moved the camera around, but yeah. Yeah. It's the curtains. Yeah. Curtains and a mirror. I know. I love those. Satanic mirror. <laughs> yeah. So he's... So both the girls are tied up. They're hanging there. They can't really move or they'll... You know, the, the noose will pull. So he's basically going to rape and murder them. And then, saved by the bell, he gets an urgent call on his police radio, which he had with him. And he's basically like, shit, gotta scoot, but I will be back to do all of the things that I said I was gonna do. So he left him over. <laughs> so he left him there. Yeah. Um, and he's basically like, don't try to run away because I'm not going very far and I'm coming right back. Um, he's like, I gotta go, I gotta go talk to the dude I'm gonna sell you guys to. Okay. That's basically what he was saying, like that kind of shit. Now, I think he was gone for like two hours. I don't even remember what the actual call was or anything like that. In that ensuing two hours, the girls actually managed to escape. Good for them. Now, I know. Like one of them, I've heard it a couple of different ways. I heard that Nancy escaped first. And basically, the other girl, Pamela, like she couldn't escape. She's she's like, I'm going to go and get help. You know what I mean? So... So she left, but the thing about it was that she couldn't get the cuffs off. Yeah. Like, she got out of the noose, all right, and she got the, I guess she her feet were all right, but she um, she didn't really know where she was. She said that I noticed on the drive that I, we were on a peninsula, so she's like, so I came to this river, like a body of, I think it was the Indian River, and she's like, so I figured if I just followed mm. the river, then, you know, I'd eventually find the road, you know what I mean, because I'd seen the river from the road, like on the drive there. And she was a really good swimmer, so she thought it'd be quicker if she got in the river and swam. So she swam with her fucking Hand hands up. cuffed, just, cuffed behind her back, yeah, like just did. with her legs and just shit like that. Up. So, um, so yeah, she did that. And um, so she swam and swam, and then she, when she was coming out of the river, um, you know, a cop was there because they'd been looking for her. You know, in the meantime, they found out what had happened. And she's like, oh, you got to go f- get my friend. Like, you know, Pamela, she's still back there. And they're like, no, it's fine. Pamela escaped too. And she was able to actually get to the police station before. Right. So they were both, they both got away. So here's the, fu- <laughs> here's the fucked up thing. When Gerard, this motherfucker, went back to the clearing and found that the two girls had escaped, 
He calls the police station where he works, and he says to his boss, who is the sheriff, Robert Crowder, this is the quote, I've done something very foolish, you'll be mad at me. That's what he said. Um, and then he said, well, what I did was I saw these two girls hitchhiking and I decided that I was going to teach them a lesson, but I overdid it a little bit. Did they believe this fucking story? Fuck no. All right. All right. <laughs> What the fuck kind of story is that? Those girls getting get didn't get away, they'd be dead. Yeah. Yeah, they would. Yeah. Absolutely. This what this wasn't his first one. This is they his don't last they one. don't think it was. Okay. No, this wasn't his last one. Okay, which which, which like I said, okay. this is fucked up. But they think that he did some before this, but they couldn't prove yeah. it. Yeah, because this is clearly he had a whole system going. So the fact that he just called them up and said that I've just, I've done something really stupid. I'm like, yeah, you have. You'll be mad at me. Yeah, okay. So, so basically, the, so the two girls made it to the station, like I said. And they told the sheriff, Crowder, they told him everything that happened. And they knew the guy's name and they're like, they showed him the picture. And they're like, yep, that's him. So when Gerard comes back and says, and tries to tell the story that, oh, well, I was just trying to scare them into not hitchhiking, like, to show them how dangerous it could be. Like, the sheriff is like, fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking fuck. Pretty much. One, you're fired. Two, you're under arrest. So he arrested him, like, right there. Um, so, yeah. Uh, the charges against him were false imprisonment and aggravated assault. So they arrested him for that, like, right there. No attempted murder. Because no. no actions were taken, but they were hung. Right. They were hanged, though, with a noose around Yeah, them. you'd think. You'd think that would be attempted murder. But maybe, I don't know if it was because he didn't have a prior criminal record, or hmm. I'm not really sure. Because, like I said, considering what he would go on to do after this, yeah. um, it's kind of a shame. And I know hindsight's twenty twenty and everything like that, but it's kind of a shame that they didn't be like, yep, you're going to jail forever. Because anybody who would do that... Um, that, like, that is a person that does not need to be running around loose. Yeah, well, first of all, in, in Mississippi, Alabama, or Louisiana, that would be kidnapping. Kidnapping carries a life sentence. You can't take anybody anywhere they don't want to be. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't charge that, him with kidnapping. Maybe it, it wasn't doesn't the matter that he's thing. in uniform. As a matter of fact, that might, that might be worse if it's a sexual assault while you're Because doing he's it using uniform. his authority yeah, as a... right. Yes, yeah. but this is the '70s. They didn't have those enhancements, probably. I don't think they did, because they didn't even charge him with that. Yeah. Even though he clearly, although maybe he could have argued, well, they willingly got in my car because I was giving them a ride. But then he took them somewhere took else. Them to a place that they took them to a place under where, false priest dance, right? That's, that's what I'm, that is kidnapping. Um, but like I said, I don't think that they would have charged him with that back then. Tom Campbell says he likes the new backdrop. Thank you, yeah. Very much. Yeah, like I said, it's kind of it was. It's always been there. It was just we yeah, moved the camera. Wasn't in shot. Yeah, because we used to shoot from over shoot there. Shoot that way going this way. Yeah. Yeah, the other wall that you used to see is right there. Yeah, that's how that works. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. 88 said he wasn't charged with attempted murder because the noose was used to restrain the girls, not to harm them. Why he was not charged with kidnapping is beyond me. Yeah, same. Yeah, most southern states, kidnapping is life. Yeah, and like I said... Because it always leads to something like this. Right. Always. I mean, the laws might have been more lax back then, yeah. I'm imagining... But yeah, all they charged him with was false imprisonment yeah. and aggravated assault. The thing about why would you kidnap somebody? Right. It's gonna. Why do you have to take them somewhere but to do something bad to them? Yeah. Obviously. Ninety percent of the time, so that's life. Yeah. Come on. So they set his bail at fifteen thousand dollars, which was a lot of money in nineteen seventy two or nineteen seventy three or yeah nineteen seventy two, but. Still not that much considering the um, gravity of what he did. But because um, he actually paid the bail two weeks after he got arrested. And his trial wasn't going to be until November of 1972, which means this motherfucker was running around free until then. So he goes back to um, him and Teresa's house in Stewart, Florida. And... 
basically he went back and got a different job. Like he got a job at like a convenience store or check cashing place or some shit like that. Now, while he was on, while he was awaiting trial, this is what pisses me off. And like I said, I know that like hindsight's twenty twenty, blah, blah, blah. But had they just denied him bail, had they just locked him up immediately, more people would be alive that are not alive now. Because a couple of months before his trial, which was set for November 1972, because like I said, he paid his bail, so he was running around loose up until now. A couple of months beforehand, September 27th, 1972, he kidnapped two teenage girls, Susan Place, who was 17, and Georgia Jessup, who was 16. Now, he didn't pick these girls up while they were hitchhiking. These two girls were actually students at like an adult education center. They were there like getting their GED. And he went there to, I'm not really sure why he was there. Like he obviously wasn't a student, um, but I don't know if he was just hanging out there, if he had some other kind of thing going on, but he was there and that's where he met them. Now he actually gave them a fake name. He told them his name was Jerry Shepard. And he said that he was from Colorado. Obviously all of this was a lie. Um, and he befriended them. They thought he was a swell guy, even though he was considerably older than them. I mean, they were, like I said, 16, 17. He was 25, 26, something like that. So oh, that's not a huge age difference. Yeah. But, um, and especially back in the 70s, I don't know if most people would have thought it was that weird. No, man, look, I got out of the army, it was about that age. Girls that are 25, 26, they don't want anything to do with you. They're going out with the guys that are in their 30s that have fucking money. Man, I was getting fogged on by girls of about this th that age during that time. You know what I mean? Late teens. It's, it, it, it's you know, it, it's up in the Boston area. The thing is, though, is that you can't take them anywhere. What are you going to do with them? You can't take them to a club. Yeah, they're too young. They're too young. They can't drink. And in that state at that time, you know what I mean, they were... Of the age of consent, most of them, you know, 17, 18, 19. But they're, they're, you can't do anything with them. You can't yeah. take them anywhere. Right. So, but the thing is, is that they like older guys. 25, 24, yeah. Well, so you, really, that's not a... Well, you got money and car. You got money and you car. Got a, and a car. You're not a high school kid. You can second, take them you somewhere. Can, yeah. You're a little yeah. bit more mature. Hypergamy, you know. But you just can't do anything with them. That's why... I, Fucking, I know you guys, some of you guys in your 20s are fucking suffering, man. Early 20s for guys fucking sucks. Because you, you're in an in-between phase. You can't compete with the guys in their 30s. And and the girls your age are all going with them. And the ones that are younger than you, you can't do anything with them. So you, you're fucked until you start getting about 27, 28, 29. Then the ones in their early 20s, 21, they might be interested in you. And you can take them to the club. You can drink with them. Really, you know, here in the U.S., it's about drinking age. That's one of the main factors. If you if you if you if you're centered around club game, you know. And me and Jenny were always about clubs. Yeah. 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 So you kind of needed to like you had be to be with somebody that yeah could get into clubs at least. Right. And a drink, ideally. Yeah. Although they didn't like you can get in a club at 18 here, but you can't drink till you're 21. In Boston, you couldn't get in until you were 19, I think. You couldn't drink. And you couldn't go into a pub, I don't think, until you're 21. But a club, you could. But then they had to put the band on your Yeah, arm. they have the band on. So, well, they have the... Um, yeah. Here, they do the big black X on yeah. your hand. Like, if you're under 21. If you're 24, 25, and your girlfriend had a band on your arm, they'd look at you crazy. Yeah, like, like... Oh, come on, man. Are you robbing a cradle? Yeah. Even though you're only, like, four years, five years older, yeah. you know. But well, like I said, so I kind of feel like this is... So these two girls were older teenagers... Mm -hmm. They met this guy at this, you know, school or the education center they were at getting their GEDs. And like I said, I don't, I'm not real clear on what he was doing there because he was older and he was already out of college, but whatever. So, um, so yeah, so they started hanging out with him, you know, played guitar, did all the shit like he did in the seventies. Now on the day that these two girls vanished, um, one of the girls moms whose name was lucille this is um actually susan's mom she actually came home and found susan and uh and her friend whose name is georgia 
And they were in the room, and Jerry, quote unquote, who's Gerard, obviously, were was there too. Now they introduced Jerry to Lucille, the mom, and they said, "Oh, we're just gonna go to the beach and hang out." Now, a lot of people, because I saw some documentaries about this, and they're like, well, why didn't the mothers of these two girls report these two girls missing for, like, four days or something like that until after? But the answer to that question is that the girls basically told the mom, we're, they didn't say they were running away, but that's kind of what they meant. They're like, well, we're going to be gone for a little while. So she wasn't initially suspicious. But the thing about Lucille was that she did not like Jerry from the jump. Like, she was introduced to him, and she's like, I think this dude is sketch as fuck. So when the girls went with him, like, you know, to be gone for a few days or to the beach or wherever they were going, she wrote his license plate number down and his, uh, the kind of car that he had, which was, like I said, a Datsun 19, from 1969. It was like a blue, like a bluish Datsun. So, yeah. So, like I said, she didn't get super suspicious right away because the girls had told her. It's like, yeah, we're we're leaving for a little while. You know what I mean? So, they left that night. Now, four days passed, and Lucille started to get worried. So, she calls George's mom, whose name is Shirley. And then she's like, well, have you heard from your daughter? And she's like, no. And she's like, and I haven't either. And she's like, and I don't like that dude that they went with. So we need to fucking do some shit. So they actually went to the cops and reported the two girls missing. And she, Lucille, gave the cops the license plate number. She written out a description of the car, a description of the man, what his name was, everything like that. Problem arose because I don't know if it was, I don't think that Lucille wrote the tag number down wrong or if the cops entered it into the system wrong. Because they actually, um they matched it to like a completely different car that didn't have comp anything to do with anything. Like it was in another County or something. And, um, the guy that owned that car didn't look anything like the dude, you know, didn't look anything like Gerard. So they were, so that was like confusing for a long time until they sorted all of that out. Now, so the two of them, um, you know, like I said, were missing and nobody knew what had become of them like until later on. And then, only about a month later, this was October 26, 1972, two more girls disappeared while they were hitchhiking. These were younger girls, Mary Alice Briscolina, who was 14, and Elsie Farmer, who was 13. Um, they were going from, like, a restaurant. They were going to, like, I don't know where they were going, but they were, like, hitchhiking somewhere. Um, so the two of them disappeared. And this was, like I said, less than a month after uh, Susan and Georgia were last seen. Now, these two younger girls, they found their bodies um, early in 1973. Both of their, they were found with um, both their legs, like, spread out really wide. Uh, Mary, Mary Alice, her, um, she'd been, like, bludgeoned repeatedly in the head. They found just skeletons or bodies? Um, well, it was several months, so I'm assuming okay. it was probably de decomposed. very decomposed. Yeah. yeah. Um, they found that uh, a bunch of fingernails were torn off her body, meaning she had probably she'd fought. She had been tortured, yeah. Or, or she had been tortured. Okay. Uh, but yeah. they had both been bludgeoned to death. Um, they both had, like, uh, horrible, horrible skull yeah. injuries. Okay, so her fingers are broken off. She must have grew long fingernails and was fighting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They weren't torn out by the roots. No. Saying, okay, right. No. So the cops, after they found the bodies, they started asking around, and Mary Alice's friends said that her and Elsie, they would usually go to this apartment, which is in Lauderdale by the sea, and the apartment was lived in by the older sister of Mary Alice's, of or one of their boyfriends or something like that. It was like a friend of the family or something. And that a guy that would come to this apartment all the time was a guy named, quote-unquote, Gary Shepard. So this guy was, like, kind of hanging around all the time. And they're pretty sure that this guy was Gerard because uh, when they showed 
the friends of the um, murdered girls pictures of this guy. They I, they were like, yep, that's him. And they said that he had also claimed to be an ex-Wilton Manors police officer, which indeed he was. So there's that. Three months after that, uh, January 11th, 1973, two more hitchhikers, uh, Colette, either, it's either good enough or good enough. I'm not sure how you pronounce her last name. And Barbara Ann Wilcox, who were both 19 years old, <coughs> they were actually hitchhiking in Iowa, in Sioux City, but they were going to Florida. Um, they actually made it, they think, as far as Biloxi, Mississippi, that was where they were last seen alive. Now, these two girls, it should be noted, disappeared while Schaefer was still out on bail. Um, you know, because he hadn't gone to trial yet, or he hadn't gone to prison yet for his, uh, for his kidnapping that he had done. Because like I said, at this point, that was all that they knew about. They didn't know about murders yet. This is all shit they found out later. So they know that he made a phone call, a long distance phone call from Cedar Rapids, Iowa to his house in Florida, not long before these two girls disappeared from Iowa. So it's possible that he was out and about and, you know, and picked them up. You know what I mean? They actually did find their bodies in January of 1977. Uh, they were, again, just skeletons. Now, the two of them were actually bound with bailing wire. And from the appearance of the trees in the area, it appeared that the girls had been t bound to the tree. And there was also an orange crate there that they thought someone had sat on to watch them dying. like Or was sitting there like watching them like while he was torturing them and shit like that. Because... His M.O. was very much to tie people to trees or hang them, like, from nooses from trees and shit like that. They're pretty sure that Gerard did this shit, too. Um, so, yeah, because that was kind of his thing. He Remember, he did it to himself when he was younger. Like, he would tie yeah. himself to trees and he got off on that. So, yeah. So, finally, in December of 1972, um, Gerard shows up in court, and this was for the abductions, the two girls that escaped, yeah. that lived. And his attorney, they offered him a plea bargain, which, again, crazy. But like I said, they didn't know that he had murdered more people while he was out on bail, like I said. I, I know they didn't know that, but it's just, it's infuriating, like, to know that that happened. So they gave him a plea bargain. He pled guilty to one charge of aggravated assault, and then got one year in jail with possibility of parole after six months. And then he would get three years probation. That's it. Cake walk. That's it. And that's for kidnapping two girls. No, he didn't kill those two. But... It's obvious he was going to do that, though. Yeah, it's obvious that that's what he was going to do. And the girls do. could have testified, but he took a plea deal, so they weren't able to testify. They just pled guilty and this and that, and there you go. Right. But uh, they should have gone to trial with that. And had the girls testify to what he told them he was going to do. Yeah. Because that's well, probably what he was going to do. They did testify yeah. at later, like at the murder trial. Yeah. But at this trial, like I said, it seemed like they didn't really take it all that seriously. What's up, Oracle? How you doing, girl? Yeah, hey. Yeah, James Homie Home says, dude's fucking grin is horrifying. Major creep vibes. Yeah, if you watch <sighs> interviews with this motherfucker, he's just, ugh. Like I said, he comes across as very arrogant and, like, proud of what he did. He comes across like like he's proud of it, like it was so awesome and so badass. And ugh, so gross. So, yeah. So Schaefer goes to jail, Martin County Jail, um, in January of 1973. And basically all he says, and keep in mind that he's allegedly killed several people in the few months that he was like prior to his trial for this you know what i mean like because he was out on bail and they think that he killed at least four people in that time period so he comes out of the trial you know and he's going to go to jail and everything like that so and he says to the reporters i made a stupid mistake there was no sex involved no one was hurt 
Oh, so then it's all good. I guess that's what he thought. Meanwhile, March of 1973, uh, Lucille Place, you know, Susan Place's mother, she actually was looking through her daughter's things and she found a letter that had been written by this Jerry Shepard person who had, you know, taken her daughter, essentially. And there was a return address on this letter. So she's like, hot damn. And she drove over there to confront the dude. So the address was 333 Martin Avenue. That was in Stewart, Florida. And Jerry Shepard uh, was not there anymore because he was in jail. And also the apartment manager, like the property manager, said to her, oh, his name's not Jerry Shepard. His name is Gerard Schaefer. That's who the apartment is registered to. And, uh, oh, and by the way, he's in jail because he just abducted and attempted to hang two teenage girls so that should make you feel better fuck's sake so basically lucille and her husband they're um driving around and like i said they figured out right around this time that probably the wrong license plate because remember she had told them the license plate of the car that they had probably got the license plate wrong so, um, cause it had something to do with, um, the different counties and like the numbers that they used to be, you know, like they, they thought it was for Pinellas County it was like instead of Martin County, it was this whole thing. So she figured that out and then went to the cops with the new information. And then when they looked up that plate, they found out that indeed that car was registered to Gerard Schaefer and that that was his address. But like I said, he's in jail at this moment. Now they asked Schaefer about this and he of course denied it up and down I never met her I never met either one of those girls blah de blah but um when they showed the mom a picture of him she's like yeah that's him that's the motherfucker that was at my house and that's who my daughter and her friend left with so then on April 1st this is 1973 now there's um a dad and his son and they're out looking for aluminum cans you know like to get some money from the recycling or whatever and they found two horribly decomposed bodies uh and this was in oak hammock park in port st port st lucie florida which again is south florida if you didn't know now they found um this is fucked up so there were like shallow graves like some of the bodies were like in shallow graves but there were sections of the victim's torso like tied to the trunk of a tree so again there's that kind of tying people to trees thing now one of the victims had um still had jeans on that had like um the roadrunner on it you know the cartoon character um the other victim was found naked so they're assuming one of them at least was raped because the clothing was just kind of piled up on the side now these two bodies were found about six miles from where the two abducted girls uh had escaped from where they had been hanged uh and got away so these two girls had obviously endured a horrible horrible ordeal before they died um it appears as though like not only had they been raped and tortured and everything like that but they had also been cut up after death uh, they were beheaded they were sliced in half with a machete all kind of other shit also i think at least one of them had been shot in the jaw so these remains were eventually identified as those of susan place and her friend who had vanished uh before so yeah a 22 caliber pistol that's what was uh used to shoot the girls and like i said they were also cut apart and they and they knew that this was probably that this was probably uh schaefer because they found um like the the way the tree bark was worn in there like looked like they had been tied on there like just like they did and also somebody had carved the initials gj into the tree gerard john i'm assuming 
So, guess he wanted to like leave a little mark there or some shit like that. This is the thirteen year old and the twelve year old. No, these were the ones that had that were um that were in the house that had met okay. him at the adult education okay, center. Yeah, yeah, right. they, they were sixteen and seventeen. 16, 17, yeah. So yeah, they did find their bodies. So now later on, does he ever say what he did to these girls? How it went down? Well, um, or he's just he's gonna fess up to it. What he did, we'll yeah. we'll get into that. that. Okay. We'll get into that a All little right. bit later because okay. that's kind of like a whole thing. <laughs> okay. okay, so he does eventually talk about this. Sort of. Sort of. Right. Sort of. But like I said, we'll we'll get into that. I brought Dakota in here, but she didn't want to stay in my lap. Yeah, she's that's our new kitty. Mouse. In case yeah, you didn't, we just adopted her. I just told our oracle about her a couple of days yeah. ago. Got her at the mall. She's a rescue. Well, kitty. at PetSmart. Yeah, yeah, she was a rescue kitty from um, Hoffmeyer Animal Rescue. Yeah, Before which is here. Four, I think it's in Leesburg. She's fourteen months old. Yeah, and another Manx. Yeah, she's a Manx. Like Pook. It was all destiny. I said, let's go, let's go, let's go see. We were talking about getting a friend for Pook. Yeah. I said, let's go look at the. Uh, that's smart. We were going to go see the Meg, you know? Yeah, we were at the mall. Right. <laughs> so we went in there, and I saw a cat. I looked at the cat, and the cat made eye contact with me. And I said, what kind of cat is that? And they said, that's a Manx. I said, when did it get here? And he says, it got here today. This morning, she said. Yeah. And I, was, and, and I saw that the adoption fee was 100 And I was like, okay. And I said, that cat's... I says, we got to go see a movie. We may come back and get that cat. And we get into the fucking theater. We're waiting for the movie to start. And I said, if that cat's there, when we go back after the movies, we're going to get that cat. So yeah. we got it. <laughs> it was a Manx. It, it was there on the the day that I showed up. It showed up the same time. It looked at me. I go, that's the cat. And it was unusual because we were there on a Monday because I yeah. was off work. Normally it would be like a yeah. Saturday. And we we don't all, yeah. we don't usually go into the Pet Smart. We have before. Because yeah. it's right around the corner from Books A Million. We were in there getting coffee. So yeah. Um, Zach says, "Is she talkative?" Yes. The cat. Yes. So she calls for her friends at night, but they're yeah. not here. We are assuming that that's what she's doing. She didn't do it last night, but she did do it the first night she was it's, here. It's, it's quiet. It's a sweet little. <laughs> like you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, and then she kind of looks at you like, "Yeah, yeah I'm yeah, fine." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was just talking. I was just trying to put put out a text. <laughs> just, they're not answering. Yeah. Yeah. She came from a shelter that had a bunch of other cats. Yeah. They were good to him at that shelter. But we don't know how long she was in there. Probably a long time. I would imagine. Because she was super quiet in the box and everything. You could put her in a box. You could drive her in a car. She wouldn't cry at all. She just silenced. She just sat there. Yeah. She didn't try to fight. She didn't yeah. try to get out. And she's been in a cage for a long time because we put her in the house. And she's like, wow, look at the size of this place. She walked... Check the whole place out, upstairs and downstairs. And then now she's confined to like the top ste step on the stairs here. She lives there. She just loves that step. There, yeah, one little <laughs> spot. And then she'll go up and look out the back window. Right now she's running around the house actually though. But she sleeps a lot. Eats a lot too. She's a little skinny yeah. when we first got her. She's very small. But yeah, she's been eating like a pig since she got here. <laughs> Mr. A.D. has got Siamese says it speaks full sentences. Here. Yeah, I've heard that Siamese are very, very vocal. One of the best cats you could get. You very could find vocal. Them. Seal points, chocolate points and stuff. Worth a lot of money. Real smart cats. Manxes are right there with them. A little bit underneath, I think, in terms of... Because uh, Siamese are fucking real talkative and real intelligent. Yeah, I, was, I always thought, like, Pook is pretty talkative. She doesn't talk loud. Yeah. But you definitely know when she wants some shit. Yeah. <laughs> A little British hunting cat, Manx. I mean, yeah. We got the, this new one's a stubby Manx. It's got a little four-inch tail, probably. Yeah, it's probably about half yeah. the length of like a regular tail. It actually Pook looks... just has like a stump, like that's that yeah. long. But this kitty has one that's about that. It long. actually looks like a North American bobcat. A little bit, what yeah. What it looks like, yeah. A little bit, yeah. Oracle says my cat Sneakers was a talker. As a kitten, she once tried to climb a bookcase. And I got her down, then she muttered this string of noise that sounded like I never get to have any fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> I can understand it. Pookie, makes, she makes, basically just makes kind of like um, 
like a little frustrated sound like if you tell her no like something she wants to do like go in the closet and shit like that and you tell her not to or you drag her out or something she's like she gets like yeah she gets all frustrated yeah she's like i'm sick of this shit (laughs) fucking sucks why can't i just do what i want motherfuckers yeah, I want to go in the closet. <laughs> okay, fine. I don't know why she wants to go in the closet. So yeah, much. she gets in there and she was like, oh, okay, nothing's here. Okay. She's like, I thought it was going to be cooler yeah. than it actually is. Yeah, Tammy said, both of my cats just showed up at our house, which doesn't sound impressive until you realize we live in the middle of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when I was growing up, we always had cats just show, show up, up randomly. Yeah. And then we were like, oh, I guess you're, you're a our country, cat now. If you're in a country, that's how you get animals. In, like, in, in Heidelberg, Mississippi, a little bitty town, you didn't have to buy animals. They show up. Cats, dogs, yeah, raccoons even, <laughs> squirrels. Hey, got any food? If you feed them, they just keep coming back. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, so where I might need another drink okay. probably because I got a little yeah. while left to go on the okay. case. All right. Even though it's getting to be nine thirty, it's getting to be my bedtime because I gotta get up real early. But yeah, so uh, let me see where was I? So um. So yeah, so basically what they did at this point, after they identified the bodies, um, they told Gerard Schaefer about this, and they're like, yeah, bro, pretty sure it's you. Uh, So he asked for a public defender. Now, interestingly, the public defender he was given was a dude named Elton Schwartz, who, fun fact, ended up marrying his ex-wife later on, which I thought was a little bit weird. I mean, it doesn't have anything to do with anything, but I just thought that was kind of weird. So basically what they did, because um, the situation that the two girls had escaped and this situation here with like the two murder girls, obviously very, very similar. So they actually got search warrants for Schaefer's car and his house and his mom's house because they did find out that he like stashed shit there. You know what I mean? So they go through all of his shit. Now, interestingly, when they're looking through his mother's house, they found in a bedroom that was locked, they found 300 pages of quote unquote short stories that were also illustrated. Like I said, you can see most of this stuff online um, that Gerard had written. Some of them were handwritten. Some of them were typewritten. um, And they went back. A while like he'd been writing them for many years all of these stories none of them were normal uh all of them were basically like stories about whores and sluts getting humiliated and raped and murdered um you know but at the hands of a quote-unquote rogue cop Okay. Almost all the stories, as far as I know, like almost all the stories were in first person and uh, shit like that. So some of the character names in these stories had names that were exactly the same or were very similar to girls that were later linked to, like that were missing or went missing around the same time as he would have been around. You know what I mean? So that's why they think that there are a lot more victims out there. Um... So, uh, so yeah, so, uh, and one of the things I mentioned this earlier, but he was real into hanging the girls up, like from a noose, like he did to the uh, girls he abducted that got away and then making them drink a whole bunch of fluids so he could watch them pee. You know what I mean? Like he's real into that. This weird fetish shit. He's real into that. Also a lot of what? This is like snuff fetish. Yeah. Yeah. Gotta die and pee simultaneously. Mm Mm-hmm. I wonder if it worked. I don't know. Yeah. I'm not about to he try would, it. He out, would so. lie. He would lie if it if it worked or not. That's true. I mean, because you'd have to wait a long time for the body to process that. What's he making him drink? Water? Um, wine or beer. Okay. In yeah, the story. Okay. Yeah. These are his stories. Yeah. We don't know like it's, it's true. Well, well, yeah. Okay. You'll get into it. A little okay. bit, yeah. We're gonna get a little bit into that. Um. So, another thing, and this is something that Ted Bundy did, and um, fucking Green River Killer did this shit too, or uh, Gary Ridgway, where he would 
at least according to these stories, um, that he would leave the bodies out in the woods and like a week or two later he would go back and have sex with the bodies. Yeah. So Barry he, Ridgway did that shit. So, yeah. And fucking, he was So doing, he was a he, necrophiliac he too, back, allegedly. Um, weeks later, in the summer heat, and the cops would be like, dude, that was like three, four weeks later. Why'd you do that? And he goes, it was free. That's what Gary Ridgway said. Because it was free. That's some weird shit, man. Yeah. It was rotten, too. But it was uh, it, it, but it was free. See, that's what I mean. To wrap my head around. The dudes are not wired right, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. What, nor- what person in their right, right mind would even think of that? Why would you even think of that? Something about the decomposing, the decomposing body also was erotic to him. It's just fucking un- unbelievable. And I never want to let people forget that Ted Bundy did that shit too. Yeah. He wasn't no sexy ass serial killer. He was no. a gross necrophile. Gross necrophile that kept women's heads. Yeah, and they got rotten. Toys. Yeah, right. They got rotten. He's a nasty ass. They get kind of stale after They're a They're all while. fucking nasty. I'm just saying that it's yeah, like these are nasty motherfuckers. Like I said, I do kind of feel like there's a little bit of a thing where it's like, oh, Ted Bundy, and he's like, he was so good looking and blah de blah. I'm like, motherfucker, fucked rotted heads. Yeah. So, Beat women to death. Nothing. With tire irons. Nothing sexy about that. Nothing. Yeah. At busted all. women's skulls with tire irons and shit. Shit like that. Yeah. There's nothing sexy about that at all. And he was a pussy. Yeah. He was a fucking pussy. Dad too. Yeah, so um, so there was a lot of necrophilia in the stories. Um, he was also real into medieval torture, that kind of stuff. Like he was fascinated by that kind of thing. Um, they also found at this house, which is it's either his house or his mom's house, they found a whole bunch of guns, a whole bunch of hunting knives, um, a bunch of rope. They found a bunch of porno magazines that he had altered like that he had drawn in there to make it look like the women in there were pissing themselves or shitting themselves or you know they were headless or had no bullet ser- wounds or something like that no other serial killer has mentioned this I, this is a fantasy he has yeah that he's talking about well yeah I mean, he talks about it a lot like yeah. in his stories and like I said he had like a bunch of drawings that he did yeah. and like magazine pictures that he altered to get because he got off on that for some reason I'm not 100% buying it that it went down that way when he was there this is something I think he added to it in hindsight I'm just, I, I'm just not really buying it well I will tell you that so they not only found all that like just pictures he had drawn and shit yeah. but they also found a bunch of black and white polaroids uh 37 of them matter of fact uh and several of these seem to show women being mutilated okay um seem to show yeah well they couldn't tell who the women were okay because they couldn't quite see their faces so they weren't so these were likely like other victims they just didn't have enough information to identify black them. and white polaroid who developed them it's a polaroid, it's a polaroid. It's it just pops out of the okay. camera okay. that's what a polaroid right. is because there's a co- polaroid company there too I didn't no know. when people say a polaroid just, they mean right. that kuching that just comes out ones. i've only seen color ones no they have black. well you can buy black and white polaroid film yeah yeah okay. of course you can i bought it before but yeah, you can you can buy black Everybody and white. Everybody chose black and white. Maybe you thought it would be more arty. Who fucking knows? The dude's a fucking lunatic. Hmm. Also, this is special. Um, some of the photographs also showed, much like BTK, although kind of grosser, I'm going to say. Uh, they had Gerard there in his women's clothing, hanging from a tree. Like I said, BTK did that shit too. But... Just as a special little extra, um, Gerard had shit smeared all over his ass. See, there you go. There you go. He's got this fucking As far as fantasy. I know, BTK didn't do that. He's got this fantasy, see. He's adding that. He's into scat. He's into scat and pissing and shit. Which. <laughs> Loss of bodily control. I think it's that's what it is. I think that's what... And I know that there is a small you know, like subset. Humiliation afterwards. It's humiliation. Because, look, I have been to 
I, I actually it was in Fort Lauderdale. Now that I'm thinking about it, I have been to a fetish party where nobody was doing that live, but they did have like some porn going on like up yeah. in the on the TVs and stuff, and yeah. some of it was scat porn. Yeah, and I was just kind of like. I'm trying to drink over here, okay? Yeah. It's just like, I don't need to fucking see that. Like, it wasn't all over the kind of shit, but... Because that's a very extreme, and it's kind of like a minority of people that are into that. I mean, it's... Like I said, it's like everything else. I think it's disgusting, but... If you're not... If you if everyone's consenting, you're not hurting anybody, fine. But it's just like, I'm, you know, I don't want to hang out with you or nothing, because I'm sure your breath is terrible. There's enough... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what he's talking about kind of reminds me of another fetish, though. I think what... I don't think he's so much into the scat element of it. I think he's more into the loss of bodily control. That's what I was gonna and, say. Yeah, and there's a, something that's there's something that's more because it's a humili kind of like humiliating. You couldn't hold. Yeah, it. it's kind of like back in that fucking you, hold your water. What was that? What was that fucking movie? Fucking uh, that, that was Sybil. Sybil. Yeah, Sybil. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. There's a there's a fetish. A, I think it's called chalismophilia or clasmophilia, something like that, where you just, where a woman fills herself up. It's usually a woman. It's a, a guy puts a woman in bondage. She's hanging from the ceiling or something above a damn plastic swimming pool, child swimming pool. And uh, he just keeps fucking filling her up in, with an enema. Until she just can't hold it anymore. The fucking belly gets inflated. She's and they're measuring. They make videos of measuring how much water went in there. And the idea was is just until she just can't hold it anymore. So yeah, that's what he's talking about. Yeah, like you said, that's I, what he's talking his about. big thing was he was very misogynistic. Yeah. He pretty much thought of almost all women as whores who were taunting him with their sexuality. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't, like, he could apparently get laid, like, he got married and stuff like that, but he still thought of women that way. And so I do think that that, that he got off on the humiliation more than anything. He's thinking of women in that way. That it, that's a fetish he has. Yeah. That's what he wants them to be. Yeah. Yeah, he's projected. Yeah. He wants right. him to be like that. Right. He wants him to be all these slutty whores that are just tempting him. Because, yeah. like, I don't know if you were in here um, yeah. when I was talking about it, but when he was a teenager, like, one of his friends said that he got really angry that this girl, who was the same age as him, who was a yeah. teenager, he thought that she was deliberately, like, undressing in her room where he could see her to taunt him. Even though she was just in her room, like yeah, changing clothes, looking, like normal. Yes, yeah, right. It's probably what. And he was like really anger, like he was like he was gonna do something about it. Like yeah. she deserved to get fucking yeah, killed. These women, of that. these women, they're out of control, trying to try to turn me on. How dare they? <laughs> that's his thinking. They're trying to. Which, turn like, me is, on. that's very they're common in these types of her. rapists yeah. and killers and stuff yeah. like that. It's it's a weird. Yeah. Narcissism. Yeah. BTK was like that too. Yeah. He kind of felt like everybody, and it, and uh, Catherine Ramsland like even pretty much said this explicitly. Like he didn't really think of any of his victims as humans. He just yeah. thought of them as like projects, as like something to, um, to just like he just wanted the outcome. He just yeah. wanted to like get off. And so it was just like a thing to it's him, like an it's, object. It's almost kind of like the part of the Madonna horror complex. Yeah, I mentioned I, that earlier. I've heard foreign guys from the fucking East, all right, who are real religious. All right, <laughs> fucking their main thing is they tell some woman just, "Why are you dressed like that?" This is this is a while back. This is fucking 10, 15 years. I don't think they're like that anymore, fucking, because everybody's kind of moved forward a little bit. Why are you dressed like that? You're just running around trying to seduce men. And you look at the girl he's talking about, she's just dressed normally, you know what right. I mean? Because it's projection. And it's and when you have guys that certain, come from certain cultures that are real restricted, they, they don't they, they see everyone as fucking offending them, you know, and their belief system. Yeah, it's well, just that's horrible self absorption. Self absorption, right. Internet I think has en ended a lot of that. That no, they're not doing that. To offend you, they're doing that because that's normal in their culture, you know. 
Well, like I said, I think a lot of these types of... It's a certain kind of mindset. You see it a lot in these types of dudes where they think people are doing things at At them. them. Right, yeah. Well, this dude seems like maybe he was from some kind of an environment where it was very self-absorbed, like he said, and almost kind of maybe uh, uh, fucking cloistered in a certain way. He sounds naive. Sounds like a naive guy who's just fetishizing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, yeah. Because if you looked at if you looked at BTK, that motherfucker was naive compared to me, and he's out fucking doing all this kind of crazy shit. He could not internalize reality. You know what I mean? Yeah. He couldn't see things for what they were. He wanted to see it a certain way. He chose to see it that way. Part of it was, I think, something wrong with his head and his brain, but you know, he's a psychopath. But they got other like second of something. There's shit that I do that might fall within the realms of being psychopathy. But you know, I think I would be considered to be a, like a high functioning psychopath if I was one, because I can care about people that I know. You know what I mean? I'm good around children. I don't make those kind of weird decisions like that. But then I can be in a military unit and fuck people up and fucking you know I can fight and like that. And um, so I don't know. Makes me wonder how accurate all these fucking terms actually are. But I've seen dudes like this, and fucking I've seen pathological liars. Granthers isn't here. We grew up with a pathological liar that we knew when we were in high school. He's not in the comment section. You know it when you see it. Those dudes are different. And the same kind of mentality you see in pathological liars is the same kind of mentality you see in serial killers. Whenever I fucking hear a serial killer, see recordings of a serial killer talking, it reminds me of the pathological liar that we knew. Yeah, I imagine there's a lot of overlap. Yeah. Well, because it's... it's the same tone. And, well, a lot of serial killers, I mean, particularly um, sexually motivated serial killers, which this guy is, which BTK yeah. was, um, they are very fantasy prone. Like, a lot of people have weird fetishes there's nothing yeah. wrong with that i don't even i don't even think that would be considered abnormal because everybody's got their thing you know what i mean it's like like i said as long as you're not hurting anybody it's not a big deal but these dudes that's like all they think about like they yeah. take it to like an extreme yeah. like i feel like most people have like certain things that they like but it's like they're not spending their entire yeah. fucking life thinking about it yeah their yeah. life doesn't revolve around it yeah, like, you know, we, 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 me and Jenny have come out. We're in the industry, the adult entertainment industry. Fucking, um, and I totally understand the science behind those products. I also know the effects that they have. There's negative effects that they can have on people. The thing is, that's your choice. Uh, you don't have to watch that. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Fucking, it's just like crack. Crack is bad, but you don't have to smoke it. Right. Okay. Um... I've done drugs. You can do them and walk away from them. Some people can't. And if you can't walk away from them, don't do them. Yeah, it's probably better to just not Yeah, just don't do them. And it's just... Um, oh, shit, I forgot where I was going with this. What, what were you saying before? I was just saying that... Um, just because we make some of these products doesn't mean that we're fetishizing it or think about it all the time. For us, it's just like a product that we make. It's like a lark. Yeah. You know, we really do it. That's not normal life. We're selling fantasy. Yeah. And yeah. it's fun. We it's enjoy fun. it. Yeah. But it's not... And it's also not normal sex, though. Right. And it's the same when we're doing a show on StreamMate. Our job is to help these dudes fucking get out some frustration so they can express themselves. I'm... I'm... I'm um, and, you know, they, they will turn their cameras on. We see who they are. They're just... They're nice guys. They're just trying to get through the day. Well, they're just regular-ass people. Regular dudes. Okay. And, um... It's almost just kind of like a service. It's not prostitution. It's legal. It's they're just kind of like custom, custom to order live porn. So Duke could get off. Right. And you know we had a couple, a couple days ago. We had a guy from England who was a customer. He was on us. He was on with us for about ten minutes, and they're like, "What's going on, man?" He goes, "Oh, dude, I'm in London." He didn't say London though. He just said England, didn't he? Yeah. He says, "I'm in the office, horny as hell." So what he wants to do? Because it doesn't matter. Okay <laughs> so he's fucking jerking it in the office. 
And I was like, hey, good for you. All right. We didn't see who he was, <laughs> but he was honest about what the deal was. He just couldn't take it anymore. Like I said, he was so polite. I was into Yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're not scuzzy. They're just like anybody else. And they got money. And uh, they want a live show. Yeah. And some people sure. are specific in what they want and some people not so much. Some yeah. people are like, nah, whatever. Yeah. But some people have very specific things. Right, like. yeah. But like I said, nothing too weird. We, we haven't yeah. got anything like everything's, to... Yeah, everything's all been agreed. The only weirdest thing is we had two requests to like me rough her up. But that's not that It's not weird. that weird. That's pretty common. It's not that weird. That's yeah. a and I know how to pull the punches. And not the punches, but I know how to pull the slaps and make noise. and It's it's acting. It's yeah. Acting. I'm not hurting her. No. Yeah, but, he uh, wouldn't do that. Right. <clears throat> Although it puts on a good show, they pay for it. Yeah. And we have four or five guys jumping in and watching it. Throwing their two cents in. Do this, do that. Got a new camera. Fucking to do, to do cool shit. With a light on it. With a light on it. It has a ring light. And a tri- tripod. You're watching the, through the new camera. Yeah, we don't have the ring light on. We have right. the big ring light on, but I don't yeah. have the ring light. It's the the camera has a little bitty ring light it's on. It's on a big long extension cord, so I can move it all around here. Get floor shots, up shots, whatever. Because I, I was doing that during certain times, and that that guy was going, "Oh man, I love the camera angles." Because <laughs> most people don't are just. Most most pe- people that stream is a single woman and she can only stream through her webcam, so she can't. She can only give one angle. I'm going POV, man. Yeah, he's pulling it off like and a cameraman. It <laughs> it like, yeah, it's a good <laughs> yeah. Up shots, down shots, fucking whatever. Close ups. Close ups. And now we have one with a light on it. That's that'll yeah. be better because then be it won't. Better. Yeah. Cause then it won't be dark when we like, be, pull back. Won't be dark. Cause I'm always like, is, is the light good? Is the light good? And he's giving me a thumbs up. Okay. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Eighty Eight said something new I learned about sex from Tom and Jenny that I will now search for a way to erase. I guess he's talking about the um, filling the the woman with fluid and then waiting for. Yeah. Yeah. I thought uh, I thought belly inflation. That's fucking one of the. I mean, I didn't. I'm not gonna say I thought that was common, but I thought it was not uncommon. Yeah. Belly. Some dudes are just into I don't this. really have any desire to do that. How much can you but... hold? Look at her belly. You know, it's usually some cute little girl. You know, and she's like, I don't know if I can take any more. And he's like, we'll just get another few ounces in there. Fuck it, you know. It's kind of like something out of Fear Factor, They're like a challenge. You know, to how much water yeah. can you fit in there? Well, like I said, there's a lot of the yeah. a lot of the porn and like and Tom watches. He'll show me this kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. A lot of it's like it's not even so much arousing as it is just kind of like wow, like it's like like I said, it's like a challenge. Like, like a challenge. hey, check out this woman; she can stick her entire arm up her asshole. Yeah, up to the all elbow. the way up to her elbow. To elbow. And I was like, yeah, holy shit, look at that. Yeah, and she's like cute as hell. Like I said, Fazley. you're like God. I said everybody's good at something. Yeah, See? she's making money off that one skill, and she's doing it in the elevator with her with her boyfriend. Like I said, money. respect making money. Hey, if you can find, if you can do, I can't do that. <laughs> Not that Damn, I've ever tried. I'm Damn. just saying, it's like, I, I don't think I can yeah. stick my entire arm up my ass. She practiced. Got yeah, she's be. like, I'm going to be the best arm be, sticking up my ass person. There's got to be some kind of lived. jeans. There's got to be some kind of jeans for that. Yeah. <laughs> she's thin or something, so, you know. Yeah. All right, so where was I? Yeah, okay. we got to get back to this because otherwise I'm gonna. It's we'll gonna, never I'm, get. Done I'm gonna be show. up all night and. Yeah, where, where's this cursor at? How far down are we? It's right there. Okay, good, good, good. We're making progress. All right, yeah. Okay, so when we last <laughs> went off off the rails, yeah, um, <laughs> we were talking about them searching this motherfucker's house and finding all of his stories and his drawings and his weird pictures and shit like that. Like I said, oh, the the shit smeared ass. That's that's where we got distracted. They also found a jewelry box. Inside this jewelry box, they found jewelry, obviously, and also some other pieces of clothing, um, passports, IDs, that kind of stuff, belonging to several teenage girls and young women, some of whom were known to be missing, and some of whom, uh, some of which belonged to uh, women that they had found murdered. Uh, they did actually find a, like a, sort of like a, um, like a necklace or a bracelet charm that was heart shaped, uh, that had the initials MTN on it. Um, they, so they found that. They also found, uh, a gold locket with the name Lee on it. And it so happened that when, um, Gerard was younger, 
uh, he had a neighbor named Lee Hainline Bonadies, and she went missing in September of 1969, and they never found her. So they're assuming that um, he did something to her, although as far as I know, they have never found her body. But they also found driver's licenses belonging to um, two girls who were hitchhiking, Barbara Ann Wilcox and uh, Colette uh, Goodenow. And uh, they had both been reported missing in January of 1973, so their IDs were both in his house. Uh, they also found some teeth and bone fragments on the property as well. So, again, a little suspicious. Now, um, they also found another, a couple of human teeth that he had, like, in this little, like, case. Like, he had them special. Which is fucked up. Uh, so, yeah. They also had uh, Georgia Jessup, who was one of the girls that had been uh, abducted. You know, like I said, the mom had... She was there in the house, and they said, hey, this is Jerry. We're going with him to play guitar or whatever. Um, she was one of them. They also found her suede purse in his possession. He had actually given it to his wife, Teresa, as a gift. Um, shortly after the bodies of these two girls were discovered, he called his wife and told her to get rid of the purse. Um, but she didn't. What? Kitty's yelling. Cat dog called us here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so he tried to say, oh, it's, it's a different purse or some shit like that. But obviously it's fucking the same one. So yeah. So at this point, um, the investigators think they have enough evidence to at least connect him to nine murders, considering all of the stuff that they found in his house, his mom's house and in his car, including bone fragments, teeth. Uh, IDs, jewelry belonging to people that they knew were missing or murdered. Uh, so they thought nine uh, between 1969 and 1973. Now, a newspaper or magazine later that same, right around that same time, they actually published a list of 28 people that either were missing, like they didn't know where the bodies were, or had been murdered and that was unsolved, that were close enough to his M.O. to make them assume that this is probably the same perpetrator. You know what I mean? Um, so, yeah, that's where the 28 figure comes from. Um, as far as I know, I think that mostly came from the media, just them trying to, like, link these missing persons cases. The cops at this time were saying nine that they thought they could definitively link him to, but I'm sure it's probably more than that. So, uh, in May, later that month, uh, Gerard Schaefer was formally charged with first degree murder for, uh, the two murders, Susan Place and Georgia Jessup, because those, they found the bodies, they had all the evidence, they had these, the two moms, like, tracked down the dude, they had seen him, uh, you know, he was the last person to see them alive and all of that kind of stuff, so they had, like, the most evidence, you know what I mean? So they sent him to the infamous Chattahoochee which is a city, but, like, if you live in Florida, especially when I was growing up, and they said, they're going to send you to Chattahoochee, because that's, like, a big, famous, like, mental hospital, like, up in the panhandle. Um, so, yeah. So they sent him there uh, for psychiatric examination. Um, they basically said that he was suffering from psychosis, duh, paranoia, and acute sexual deviation. Um, but that he could still, that he was still sane and could stand trial. He was trying to like get sent to a hospital instead of jail, but you know what I mean. Um, but yeah, he basically denied everything and he was just like, um, no, this is just all a terrible mistake. Um, I'm totally innocent, blah, blah, blah. So he goes to trial in September of 1973. Now at the time... And this is not the case anymore. But in 1973, um, the death penalty had been suspended because uh, the Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme Court, had deemed it unconstitutional. So the most he could get was like, you know, life sentences, basically. Um, so basically, he pleaded uh, not guilty and just kind of sad. He did not uh, testify or anything like that. Uh, uh, you know, his counsel advised him not to, so he didn't. 
he did testify at a pre-trial hearing uh, where he basically just said he was completely innocent. And they asked him, you know, obvious questions like, hey, where were you when this murder happened or something? And he just would use the I don't remember defense, which, you know, that, that never fucking flies. So the jury, so after the whole trial and everything like that, um, you know, I read like a big long thing of the trial, but it's not, it's basically just going over most of the shit we already went over. So the jury um, deliberated for about five hours and then came back to guilty verdicts, first degree murder. And basically, um, after that, the, the dude, Gerard, he didn't really get like all upset about it. He was just kind of like, oh, well, that's kind of how the cookie crumbles type of thing. Uh, he said, I had a good defense, but I'm innocent. That's what he said. No, you're not. No, you're not. So he got two concurrent uh, terms of life uh, imprisonment. And again, he was trying to like lobby to get sent to a psychiatric hospital instead of prison, but they were like, uh, no, sorry. So basically, okay. So you think this fucking story is over. It's not. So he goes to jail. And... What ends up, he's, he basically says, I didn't do any of this stuff. Uh, the prosecutors were, quote unquote, overzealous. Uh, law enforcement were corrupt. Um, his own defense attorney, Elton Schwartz, was conspiring against him. And as I mentioned, his defense attorney did end up marrying his ex-wife later on, but I don't think that had anything to do with like him trying to get him and put in prison or anything like that. So... Um, <coughs> But he made up a bunch of stories, too. You know what I mean? Now, while he was in jail, let me say this. It's always a bad thing when, if you're in jail, all of the other inmates fucking hate you. <laughs> all the other inmates hated this motherfucker. Well, one, he's a cop. Two, he's a rapist and a murderer. Yeah, right. well, yeah. One, yeah. he was a cop, and that's not going to fly. Yeah, he's a rapist. Yeah. And some of his victims were young teenagers yeah oh yeah and also um he was known as a snitch like he always was like always narking on people now, yeah. like to get special privileges and stuff like that which is um yeah uh, other inmates tend not to like that all that much uh he also got in trouble several times in prison usually he would be put in solitary because he was trying to get people to send him women's underwear through the mail like into the prison <laughs> Please give me some panties. Yeah, right? As so like, <laughs> That's okay. some fucking funny shit. So here's the shit. Now, he wrote, like I said, he wrote extensively all of these quote-unquote fictional short stories. He called it killer fiction. And even though, here's the thing. He kind of wanted, I feel like he kind of wanted to have it both ways. He wanted to be, because sometimes he would just blow his own horn about like i'm the world's greatest serial killer blah -de blah but then if somebody called him like a true crime writer for example like called him a serial killer he would sue them <laughs> I'm not for defamation yeah, like funny. he was always filing like frivolous lawsuits yeah. for people calling him a serial killer one time he filed a, a lawsuit I think just because an author called him doughy or fat or something <laughs> um yeah he sued because i mean they all, they all got thrown out yeah What's up, Warlock? Welcome to the show. Hey, what's up? <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Oracle said, I'm going to wander off, y'all. I'll see y'all at the next sidetracks. No. Oh, we'll see you later. Yeah, we'll see you Friday. Um, but yeah, so he was basically trying to sue everybody. While on the other hand, he wanted to be the world's greatest serial killer, but if anybody actually called him a serial killer, he would sue them. You can't call me that. That's defamation. That's funny. Which is fucking stupid. Like I said, he tried to have it both ways. So what ends up happening is that he, um, so all of this shit that he wrote, he was approached by his ex-girlfriend, like his high school girlfriend. I think her name was, what was her name? Sandra London or something like that. And um, she, yeah, Sandra London, that was her name. She had become a true crime writer in the interim. And when she found out what this motherfucker did, she started corresponding with him in prison and said, you know, do you want to collaborate? Like, do you want to publish like all this shit that you wrote? You know, we could make some money. She would, she could make some money off it, I guess. I don't, I don't know what the law was like in the seven. Cause I know now, uh, nowadays, at least in Florida, I think you can't make money. Like the person in jail, like can't make money. Like if I'm a serial killer, yeah. right. Like I can't write a book about that shit and make a million dollars. Like you yeah. can't, 
you you can write a book if you want to, but all the money has to go to the victims. That's yeah. how they do it, which, the, you know, that's fair enough. Did you hear that, cat? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. What is she crying about? I don't know. She's calling her for her friends already. It's okay. I'll, I'll you look, you have look. new friends now. Yeah. Yeah, just make sure she's all right. Yeah, she hurt. I mean, every single time, she just talks. I don't yeah. think she's, like, in distress or anything. She, no, she's calling for her, her um, prison friends. Yeah. Her, her little... So, so yeah, so Sandra London starts, like, corresponding with him, and they're going to put out, they put ended up putting out, like, a couple of books. The first one's called Killer Fiction. That was uh, 1990. And then they did one called Beyond Killer Fiction, which came out in 1992. So these are ostensibly fictional short stories. However, um, almost all of them, uh, if not all of them are in the first person almost all of them have the main character being a quote-unquote rogue cop and all of them involve the horrible humiliation and rape and murder and torture of women that he calls whores and sluts and everything like that but the thing about it is that and a lot of the stories detail um the details in the story like correspond very closely to some crimes that he never straight up admitted to but then the weird thing about it is that in some correspondence that he wrote to her uh he basically all but confessed to a couple of the murders because he said oh well they keep asking me to confess to things but it's like what is this he wrote this story called murder demons and she's like what does he think what do they think that is so he's almost like implying that he just wrote about what really happened. And I'm saying, I haven't read all of the stuff, but I did read portions of it. I wouldn't recommend it because it's fucked up. But some of the stuff in there does correspond very closely to some of the actual crimes. So while I think that some of it was probably fantasy or probably exaggerated, I think a lot of it was shit that he actually did, which is what makes me suspect that he killed a lot more people than they know about. But see, the thing about it, again, he wanted to have it both ways. Like, he would say, oh, well, they keep asking me to confess to things, and I kind of already did that. Sort of like he's kind of implying that he already did that by writing these stories. But then, if somebody asked him about, well, what about this story, and did you kill, you know, this particular person that's missing, or something like, oh, it's just a story. It's just fiction. So he wanted to, like, have it both ways. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, he wanted everybody to know, like, all of the shit that he did, but then he wanted to have plausible deniability about... You know what I mean? It was just like fucking fucked up. I wouldn't believe up. anything about those stories. The, well, the but the thing about it is... Line of this, I bet you they went along the lines of his fantasies. Yeah. But that's probably not how it, the murder actually went down. Well, some of them were similar to the way that they think some of the murders did happen, though. Well, the situation was probably right. close. But I bet you the what the victims did and how they reacted was not accurate. And the things that they said was not accurate heavily censored and he added his own fucking comments and shit if there are comments I haven't read them well this is one thing this is usually the murder doesn't go down according to Siri goes usually I mean even BTK the murder doesn't quite go down the way they fantasize about it so they have to do it again they're not really f satisfied with that one why the woman wasn't sufficiently terrified a lot of times she fought back. She said insulting things to him while she was dying. Shit she like made that. fun of his penis. She made fun of him or, 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 or like, fuck you, you know. She, she, didn't, she wasn't a willing victim. She didn't play the role she that, didn't they, play the that role. he was expecting. Okay, so a lot of times they're like, ah, that was no good. We got to do it again. Well, and like I said, he that's... he tells that story, he can't tell the story. Yeah, she made fun of me. He's not going to say that. Or she told me to fuck off. You know, it's not going to, that's, that's not going to be in his version of the story. Right. That's why I don't believe serial killers. Well, they, we'll see. That's the thing is that they spend so much time yeah. wrapped up in their fantasy lives, yeah. and they have this whole rigid idea of how they want shit to go. Yeah. And so, that's kind of going back to what we were saying earlier about like what I was saying about BTK because this guy is kind of similar, or he reminds me of him. Is that they kind of? It's almost like they expect the rest of the world to conform to their fantasies and they get very, very upset yeah. when it doesn't. Yeah. Or very surprised. Right. I mean, he, this goes back all the way back to Albert Fish. Albert Fish did some nasty shit. We did he a really show about did him too. Yeah, but he up. told stories about whole victims that they don't even know that they really existed. 
Like he told he told one story about how he killed a little black boy. There was no evidence of any little black boy ever being killed. Uh, he could have made that up out of whole cloth. Maybe he, he did it. Or he, he done it. <laughs> or he could have done it. But he probably made that shit up because he was into fucking telling stories and to make himself look as bad as possible. You know, I just. I well, like I said, believe, I kind I of feel like this dude is along the same lines. Yeah. Because if your goal in life, which don't have this as your goal in life, okay. But um, if your goal in life is to be, I'm going to be the best serial killer I can be. I'm going to be the most fucked up individual anyone has ever heard of ever in the history of the world. Then it would behoove you to come up with the nastiest, most horrible yeah. shit. And, whether, and it's a lot easier to just come up with it than to actually, you know, like do it. Exactly. Another thing is, is that a, a serial killer in, in captivity, his power is these stories. If he tells you all his stories, he's going to lose his power over you, the captor. So it's best for him to continue to make stories. He tells you what he did, and then he goes, yeah, but there's other shit I haven't told you about. He, they just keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, they keep, yeah. And doing it. They, they'll just continue to make them up. If I, not, then they'll become irrelevant and nobody will give them any attention and they won't have any power. I will give BTK credit that yeah. he actually did say in his own words that the 10 they know about that that was it. I don't know if I believe that or not, but he did say that. He didn't exaggerate. It's probably it. But I don't think he was that prodigious. Yeah, maybe not. He was too busy. He was too busy jerking off, too. He talked about, he, he told, say, he, he fucking admitted that I spent most of the time jerking off to all these fucking relics that he collected. I wonder how many hours of his life he spent jerking off. Going to all these little hidey holes. He would make rounds throughout this Can you imagine map your like, entire life to go like, being find his jerk off it? material? Which is like, you know. I mean, it's nice to have a hobby. Some underwear. But and goddamn. Some, yeah. Yeah, if you've seen the map, like if you watch the documentary, he made like yeah. a map of all these little holes that he had where he had like all, and some of it was like shit that he had taken from the victims and stuff, yeah. like underwear or jewelry or whatever. Yeah. And so, and some of it was just other stuff, like stuff he had drawn or pictures he had taken or something. Yeah. And he would like stash them around everywhere and he had the shit everywhere. Yeah. And he'd have them, I guess, in little clusters and little groups where, oh, this is, this is where I enact this fantasy. And over here is where I enact this fantasy. And you know some of them had relics or you know items taken from victims, and he he himself said you know jerking off saved a lot of people's lives, so he would continue killing a lot of people. <laughs> yeah, know? like when he was doing yeah. his weird like motel parties and yeah. stuff like that, he was doing that instead of killing instead people. Instead of killing people, right? Like as like a yeah like a salve over it or yeah. something like that because he went a long time, and that's they talked about that quite a bit in the documentary how he was kind of an outlier because. He could go like several time. years, like without doing it. Anything. Yeah. Well, well, he he basically admitted. He said these little missions of killing these women were difficult. Well, <laughs> he played the victim, and it didn't go the way I wanted. And, oh, and I had to wait in a closet for three hours. And I'm looking I know, and I was like, oh, poor baby. Like, oh man, and then, you know, and, and it was just yeah, everything mess. was me, me, and me. I didn't plan on this, and all this. it was terrible. You know, you're fucking... Oh, yeah. poor Dennis. Yeah, because it was just from his point of view. Everything was from his point of view. Yeah, he was, like, one of the most, yeah. like, self-absorbed. Yeah, and he wanted you to know that, yeah, I did all this shit, but it was hard. And, you know what I mean? And I, I was really stuck out doing this. You know what I mean? And I didn't do it right the first couple times. And then I, I, it was so dangerous, you know? <laughs> well, there's something to be said for that. Yeah, man, you're gonna get caught doing that shit. Okay. Yeah, yeah maybe you shouldn't dangerous. be doing it. Maybe you're, you should find gonna, a new hobby. Right. You're that? not, you know, it's dangerous doing this shit. You're going to run into some old, some, some woman's boyfriend. He's going to fuck you up. because Or Dennis, a woman with a big ass gun. Yeah. He's going to blow your face off. That was one of the things he said. She could have, I thought she might have come at me with a big shotgun, but she didn't, <laughs> you know. Uh, which she should have. She should have grabbed that fucking shotgun if she thought somebody was in the house. Maybe she didn't have one. Maybe she didn't have one. But, um, and Dennis, when you see fig pictures of him, he looks quite spooky, kind of. But actually, Dennis was weak. You know, he was not a big, strong guy. He, he's, he didn't work out or anything, you know. He, but, you know, to a woman, and especially an older, elderly woman, well, not really elderly, but a woman in her 50s who doesn't work out, he's a lot stronger than her. But in reality, compared to other men, fucking, no. 
Charles Rader. I'd run through three or four of those. Dennis Rader. Dennis Rader, excuse me. I always call him Charles for some reason when I'm drunk. But Dennis, <laughs> I'd fuck up three or four of those. You know. Damn, what is and, that? And, and, and it's a shame. Doing? It's a shame that dudes as weak as that, including fucking Gary Ridgway, who was a fucking rat little fucking slime ball, a bug compared to me, killed all those women. I can't understand it, you know. I don't understand it. You know what I mean? He's stronger than he was stronger than those women. He strangled them, but it's terrible. Well, it's not like they're going after fucking sumo wrestlers yeah. or anything, is it? They're right. always going to go after somebody smaller. They go after somebody smaller than them, right? Because that's how they do. Right? They choose them. That's why. That's how they select them. Mister Eighty Eight said Schaefer was the epitome of the megalomaniacal control freak. Yeah. Like many serial killers, the only control left once they're in prison is information, so they make a game of it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, and then he said, is BTK the reason every boy in the 70s and 80s could find porn mags in the woods on every excursion? Exactly. Probably. Exactly. Probably. Except, I, actually, if I was a little boy, if I found um, Raider's shit, I wouldn't, I wouldn't consider that porn. I wouldn't know what it was. He'd have some pipes with some ropes and some, uh, some hand drawings and some cutouts of a some chick's face on a three by five card out of a magazine and like her, her stats are written on the back and he would ride around with it in the passenger seat of his it. car and talk to it like and it was a yeah, real woman and then he it's would, an index card right and there'd be some underwear in there stretched out because some big old fucking nasty dude was in it you know what i mean and i just i wouldn't because i wouldn't know what i found if i was a little boy i'd be like what is this yeah, it's like this. This is that not, not. This the is same. not arousing whatsoever. Yeah, this isn't penthouse. <laughs> this isn't hustler. You know? This is not good. Yeah. I, I don't know what this is. It's yeah. creepy. That's all I know. I mean, fucking, this is in the seventies when I was a little kid. We even back then, fucking, we thought fucking <laughs> me and my little eight, nine, ten year old friends thought Playboy was weak sauce. We're like, oh no, we got penthouse today. <laughs> <laughs> That's the good shit. Yeah, it's the good shit. Yeah. Yeah. And play- another one's called. Um, Playboy was trying to be all fucking... Swank. I remember that and, one. And We Magazine. We liked that one. <laughs> but yeah, so... Um, DV Dragon says, Beaten off, a nut a day keeps the murder away. Yeah. yeah. I guess it does, yeah. I mean, once a day, that's not that's not egregious. But it's like, I, I just wonder... It's not even so much that they're beating off, like, however many times a day, but it's just that their whole entire routine, like, they have to have all of these parameters in place... Like, before they can even beat off. Yeah. Because everything has to be super specific. Yeah. And so they have to have, like, this whole, like, side... <laughs> it's like a part-time job. Yeah. Like, keeping track. <laughs> it just sounds like too much work, you know what Beating I'm saying? Beating off is a part-time job. It's, <laughs> it's too much work. That's fucking funny. It's like he's got to have a fucking... If you have to draw a map... Yeah. ...of all the places where, you're, where, where you your should, shit where is... Where you stashed, yeah. <laughs> That's it's taken over your life. Get yeah. get some help, bro. But well, yeah, he was a, we're talking about Raider now, okay? Fucking yeah. De- Dennis. Dennis was a control freak. He liked to consider himself very orderly and in control. And he had maps and fucking books that had fucking codexes in it and fucking bar graphs and all the different missions he was running. And he had a mission schedule. It's like something out of the military. Yeah, he was very organized. Because he was ex Air Force, so you know he knew how to keep things organized and orderly. And but you know, <laughs> and he always and he said that even when he during the years when he wasn't killing people, he always had like huge lists of people that he was stalking projects. Quote yeah, unquote. that he was gonna kill. That he was gonna kill. Yeah. That he was stalking. Like if the time was right, yeah. you know what I mean. Like, Although I guarantee you, he enjoyed the planning yeah. stage. Yeah, I guarantee you that if the fantasy that he was going to do it was just as good as doing it in his mind. Yeah. Thinking about it. Yeah. Well, yeah, they tend to enjoy... That's why they yeah. keep uh, mementos right. from the people because then they can go back and they can relive yeah. it like in their mind and stuff. Yeah, he thinks he's the command, though. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so, um, so where was I? Okay, so some of the... Okay, so this is like some of the shit that this dude said. Now, this was in... Uh, correspondence that Schaefer wrote to, I think this was to Sandra London, like I said, when they were talking about his books. What's that? Read DVD Dragon, man. It should, you're right, bro. You got it. Wait, where? 
Oh, it makes no sense. Weird fetish like getting off to a Subway sandwich with a fleshlight in it wrapped in women's panties. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I mean. It's just yeah. now, look, I'm not hating. Like, I know everybody has like weird fetishes and stuff, but if your fetish like takes up your entire life and it's just like super yeah. complicated, I'm just like, it just sounds like too much work. You know what I'm saying? It just sounds like a job. I got simple fetishes, I guess. Short girls with big boobs. <laughs> 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 if you're it, short, you got in, big hot, in hot shoes. Hot, fantastic fucking shoes. <laughs> hot as fuck. Great calves, just short, big boobs. Yeah, yeah. yeah Tom. If has... you've got a shirt that shows midriff, I fucking love it. Yeah, yeah Tom. Tom has like. Yeah, it's very simple. He's a simple one. Very simple. Yeah. <laughs> but this is okay. So this is something that he said. He said, "When I nabbed Jessup in place, Susan Place and Georgia Jessup, those were the two girls that he was convicted of murdering. I had been in the ghoul game for almost ten years." So I knew what to expect from these juicy young creatures at the end. Doing doubles, that's what he called like calling two, killing two girls at once, which is something that he did quite often, is far more difficult than doing singles. But on the other hand, it also puts one in a position to have twice as much fun. There can be some lively discussions about which of the victims will get to be killed first. When you have a pair of lively teenage bimbolinas bound hand and foot and ready for a session with the skinning knife, Neither one of the little devils wants to be the one to go first, and they don't mind telling you quickly why their best friend should be the one to die. So he seemed to get off on the having power over people and like making them turn on each other, I guess. Whether I think this, it's fantasy. I don't think it's real. Yeah, whether this really happened. Now, it, it, it is true that like a lot of the murders that he is suspected of committing were two girls at once, so he did do that. Yeah. I don't think the girls cooperated in the way that he wanted to. Probably not. And then what did he uh, he what did he do to him with the skinning knife? We'll see. I don't really know because it, it seemed like, like most of up. the well, most of the women. Now he did have uh, several hunting knives and he did yeah. have a machete yeah. because some of the bodies of the women that they think that he killed were cut apart, beheaded. Maybe he beheaded them, but and were and a couple of them were cut in half. Like, well, that's, that sounds like post-mortem stuff. Probably. I, I have a feeling that he killed them by strangling them. No. Well, he shot yeah, some of shot them, them, and yeah. then some of them were um, bludgeoned to death. Okay. Like he would beat them in the head. That sounds more And likely. break their skulls. Fairly simple shit. And I bet, I bet you there wasn't a lot of torture. Psychological is what it was. He probably asked them all those questions. But they probably didn't go along with it. They were probably like, fuck you. You know, I, you know... Who's going to go first? And then they'd probably just start screaming. Yeah. yeah, it's like I have a hard time believing that most, even in that yeah. situation, most people would be like, yeah, I'm not doing that. <laughs> right, yeah. That's what they would do. They'd start, probably start screaming and fighting. It didn't go down the way that he wanted it to. He's make, he's lying. It's not the way humans are. So, as I mentioned earlier, he was always kind of uh, name-dropping Ted Bundy. And he basically called uh, Ted Bundy a quote-unquote Tyro, uh, you know, like a, w which is like an amateur, pretty much. Yeah. Um, and he said, I think I mentioned this earlier, but um, he said that one of Bundy's crimes he considered like a copycat of his. And he claimed that Bundy even told him that. He's like, yeah, I did that in homage nah, to you. And lying. I'm just like, no, I don't think so. He's lying. Um, so, yeah. So... As I mentioned, even though in public he's coming out saying, I am absolutely not a serial killer, I'm innocent of all this stuff and all this other kind of shit, but then he was writing letters to this woman and saying all this shit that he had done. He said that he had first started murdering people in 1965 when he was 19 years old. And I don't really see any reason to doubt that. Um, he also confessed to a 1969... Uh, kidnapping of actually two very young girls, uh, Peggy Ron, who was nine, and Wendy Stevenson, who was eight. Uh, he said that he kidnapped them in Pompano Beach and ate them. Um, he came out in public and said he didn't do that, but in a letter to Sandra London, he said that he had done that. I wouldn't believe that. Well, that's like true. I said, it's hard to say because some of the stuff that he did confess in the letters, they're pretty sure he did do that shit. So I don't know how much of it is, um, I got a feeling that is exaggerated. Yeah, but the, the, 
the type of guy this is, he's trying to blow himself up into something that he isn't. He did some of that. But it didn't go down like he said it did. Yeah. it's Like I said, it's hard to say because he was for sure like a fantasist. Yeah. Because Sandra London, like after she'd been co- collaborating with him for a while, and then she came out publicly against him and was like, yeah, he is a piece of shit or whatever. And then he said, he's in prison, right? And he says he knows all these people on the outside. He knows Satanists. Yeah. And people in the mafia, oh, yeah. and um, people mafia in the people in the it, yeah. KKK, yeah, oh, yeah. And I can it. have you killed just like that, yeah, right? You know first what I mean? First of all, the mafia, the Italian mafia, are Catholics. Okay, they'd be the first ones to fucking cut you up. All right, they weren't in. They're not into all that rape shit. And then fucking the KKK is another fucking was was basically depending on which one. There were three of them, but fucking they were basically Christian organizations. You know, they just were. Didn't like Catholics and they didn't like blacks. Well, they 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 disliked Catholics more than they than they disliked blacks. But no, they weren't into that shit. They'd fuck you up too. He's bullshit. Yeah. So that that bullshit. actually made me laugh when I saw that yeah. like kind of thing that he was like threatening right. people. Oh, I know all these Satanists outside and they'll sacrifice yeah. you. And I'm just like, it would be the okay. equivalent of some black dude saying, "Yeah, I raped all these women and I'm gonna fucking have." The fucking, um, what do you call them? The, the black Hebrew Israelites coming after you. No, they are not about that either, okay? The black he- Hebrew Israelites were not about serial murder and rape of fucking underage girls. They'd fuck you up. Well, like I said, and, yeah. I'm, not, and I'm not trying to discount um, the fact that he did commit several murders. I actually have no reason to disbelieve that he probably did commit at least 26, 28 murders. I, I don't think that's crazy. But the fact that he came out and said, oh, I did my own list and it's more like 80 to 110, I don't know if I believe that. So I'm saying that he did do a lot of horrible shit. Um, it's just that he He's embellished. Yeah. He just embellished. And yeah. like I said, a lot of serial killers do Yeah, that. most of them do it to, to a bit, to a, to a certain degree. Yeah. So um, despite all of the... Here, here's kind of the shitty thing, though. It's like, I guess this is kind of a... <laughs> This is going to sound fucked up. This is kind of a happy ending. I don't know if it is because because he's dead, they never could really find closure for like a lot of the cases that they wanted to find closure on that they were pretty sure he was responsible for, but never really got him to confess to or give them information on and shit like that. But on the other hand, um, it was kind of like karmic justice, I guess. Because... In 1995, remember how I said that all of the other inmates at the prison like hated his guts? In December of 1995, another inmate stabbed the fuck out of him Mm -hmm. and killed him. Yeah. Now, uh, stabbed him in the eyes, like, multiple times. Um, Also, I heard that they slashed his, like, mouth open. Yeah. But stabbed him a whole bunch of times. Now, um, they're not entirely sure. Like, the guy that did it, his name was uh, Vincent Rivera. He's no hero either. He was also in prison for, like, a double homicide. But he never really said why he killed him. Um, there are several stories going around. Some of the stories are just like they had a fight over a cup of coffee or, you know, he took the last of the hot water and the dude was just like in a bad mood that day and he wasn't having it. The more common story is that he was killed because he was a snitch. That was only part of it. it, it look. <sighs> There's a tendency for people to dehumanize inmates, too, and prisoners. Yeah, pr- prisoners and inmates, they're in there, they've committed crimes. They do not like child molesters, all right? Because they have kids, a lot of those <laughs> yeah. inmates in there, all right? They also do not like serial sex offenders, like serial rapists. Because those dudes have sisters and moms and wives out there. Yeah. That they're, you know, were, they're like, wait a minute, hold on. You're out there raping and killing women? Oh, I got a, a mom. I got a wife. You know what I mean? They, you know, and I'm in here. I can't defend them. And they got motherfuckers like you out there doing that shit. Fuck you. I'm going to kill you. You know, because he's, he's locked up. He's worried about his family. <laughs> you know what I mean? All kinds of shit could happen. You know? So, no, it, it's... A serial rapist, that's not really a man's crime from a prison perspective. A prison perspective would be like armed robbery, manslaughter, murder one and two. 
especially if it's between gangs. Um, you know, a battery, assault, that kind of shit, fighting. Those are respectable crimes in prison, but not shit like fucking serial rape, pedophilia, child rape. No. That's garbage stuff, you know? It's bottom feeder shit. Yeah. Probably why he's talking all that shit. Especially if he's a cop. He's a cop and he's a cop in prison. He's got to blow himself up into, into something that he's not. To try to be as impressive as he can and as bad as he can in front of these other inmates that hate him. That's why that's part of the reason why I don't believe in half of what he said. Yeah, he killed those girls, but it didn't go down the way he said it did. Yeah, like you said, it probably didn't. And, and yeah. like I said, I'm not trying to discount the fact that he did kill a bunch yeah. of people because he did, and he and I'm sure he did horrible, horrible things to them because they know that he did. Yeah. But yeah, the way that he wrote them, it was probably similar to how it happened, but it was probably self-aggrandizing yeah. to a great degree. And it all had his fantasies were, were all fulfilled in all those different versions of the damn story. You know, I mean, part of his fantasy was, oh yeah, she pissed herself. You know, I mean, it, that probably didn't happen. That was just his fantasy. Oh yeah, she turned on her friend. That probably didn't happen either. That was just his fantasy. Yeah, that's you what know? he wanted to happen. That's what he wanted it to so happen. So then, like, maybe after he did the actual shit, he wrote about it and then changed the details yeah, that he didn't like. to fit what he wanted. So he could jack off to it later. Yeah, oh, and so he could feel like he had achieved his mission and he's a badass in front of all these people that hate him. You know. Which I think that just made them hate him even more. Of course. Because he came across as an arrogant douchebag. Of douche course, bag. yeah. Of course, yeah. I'm going to have my Satanist friends kill you and they're just... Yeah, like, yeah. Whatever. whatever. Anton LaVey, man. <laughs> Anton LaVey would fucking call the cops on you. <laughs> I mean, just like, the shit that he said, I'm just yeah. kind of like fucking horrible. But yeah, I mean, he would say other shit too, like... Um, again, kind of like bragging, but he would say stuff that was obviously like calculated to shock as many people. He's like, oh, you know, I've killed all these people. And he's like, oh, well, I don't feel like, like, like one girl that I killed, like I was disemboweling her friend and she vomited and choked on her own vomit and died. So that doesn't really count as a kill. Yeah. And it's like, what if, you know, and what about the pregnant ones I killed? Does that count as two? Like, he would say shit like that. He's so it's good. like, yeah, and it's like, he did enough horrible shit. So it's like, some of that stuff, it's like, plausible that he did something like that. But he's probably just saying that, like I said, just to shock people. It's like, oh my god, I'm the fucking worst. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because that... Make this just sound cool as he can. Right. Just... And he really does, if you see, if you watch interviews with him, his tone of voice comes across very like that. He obviously... Yeah. Seems like he's the coolest motherfucker alive. He's he thinks, full of shit. right? And so he just like comes up, but it's like he doesn't really seem aware that he doesn't sound like the coolest motherfucker alive. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's more likely that the female victims, even the young, the young ones, zoned out and fucking blanked out, and he didn't get what he wanted out of them. It just screamed. Um, the other ones just fought him and didn't go along with his little fantasies. That's what probably what happens. I wonder sometimes in the other cases that you hear about that sound a little more like the the women that actually survived these attacks. Yeah. They don't go along with any of the shit for the most part. Right. They don't. They just kill me. You know what I mean? Go ahead and kill me. Then it's that kind of mentality. Yeah, I do kind of feel yeah. like that's that happens a lot. Yeah. I mean, if you're in a situation like that, yeah. a lot of times they'll just be like, so well, that fucking totally, do it then, motherfucker. Yeah, so, so that would totally foil the fantasy of these kind of guys. That's probably what most of the women did, is resist. They didn't play into that shit. Yeah, I do feel like most people in that situation would yeah. resist or just... Well, they know they're going to die. Blank out. They know they're going to die. They, I think they blank out, scream, and resist, and zone out, and fucking, you know. I, I don't think they play into that shit. Like, remember that one guy, the toolbox murderers, they had to tell the girls to scream over and over again while they were hitting them with a fucking hammer. Because after a while, they, they wouldn't just, scream. They just stopped. Yeah. Because why would you like, keep doing it? About? So it's not satisfying to them. Yeah. It's not as satisfying as they It's thought. not the way they're picturing. It's not the way they're picturing. Because they get off, those type of killers yeah. get off on yeah. 
inspiring terror. Yeah, but it doesn't actually happen because they go into shock. Yeah, and if so, if the or, or, if the women or, are not sufficiently terrified, right. then it's not working and, out for and them. People have defense mechanisms, you know. What I mean, and anybody who if you read books on torture, you know, like what the Khmer Rouge would do to people and fucking uh, you know fucking a Cambodian killing fields type tortures where they had systematic torture of prisoners. People under un, under torture have the ability to kind of like mentally retreat and zone out. They, you can overload a person with pain to where they can't feel pain anymore. So, yeah, because it just overwhelms your it just senses, overwhelms them. right? So, I mean, if you if for you guys, you know what I'm talking about. You can get into fights where you're fighting some dude, you've been punched fucking seven or eight times, and it just looks like the camera shook. You don't feel it, you know. You might feel it the next day, sore as fuck, but you don't feel it. Well, they're going through even more of that. You know what I mean? Fucking, it's even worse. So they can't really feel a lot of what's happening. Their body just starts kind of, the mind retreats and the body just kind of acts like a robot. It's just responding to what's happening. You know, conscious thought really quite isn't there. They're probably not playing into the dude's fantasies. They're just... Like a cat, you know what I mean? You take a cat and you start fucking trying to set a cat on fire or something like that. It just screams. You know, it doesn't play into your fantasies. It's just, you know, they had a, some fucking Russian kid that was putting cats in cages and throwing fucking gasoline on them and setting them on fire, videotaping it. They eventually got that guy. I think he was Russian. This was a long time ago. Back in the old internet. Back in the 90s. I think they eventually got the kid. Those cats didn't go along with anything. They just fucking screamed and died. That's probably how these those girls were. That reminded me of that. What's that dude's name? That Luke Magnona or whatever. His yeah, name. yeah. That the one that that documentary that they did. Don't fuck yeah, with cats. Yeah. Yeah. The that internet tracked shit, that motherfucker down. The shit there too, man. Suffocating the little kitties in the ziploc bags and shit. Yeah. He needed yeah. his ass whipped. And then he killed his Chinese boyfriend. Yeah. Little fucker. How to stomp that dude's head flat. There'd been nothing left for him except a greasy spot. And nothing of value would have been lost. No. Fuck that dude up. DVD Dragon says fetish should not be project management. Yeah. I would not want to do supply chain management for dead bodies in the woods and yeah. sexually promiscuous subway sandwiches. Just beat off and go about your day. Yeah. Exactly. Like I said, if it's more than a few steps, it's just too much. It's look, it's too much. Look, man, a couple days ago, I came across this shit again. I was watching some of my, some of my science programs, and they mentioned 1970s and fucking, le uh, fucking levels of lead in the environment with the fucking... Leaded gasoline, and uh, there was still leaded paint at that time. Yeah, I remember that. And you read about what some of these dudes were doing in the 60s and 70s. You, you go like, man, that can't be fucking normal. And my whole lead theory that I talked about a long time ago, it's all starting to come together. I mean, uh, fucking more modern people, you know what I mean, of the fucking... 2020s doctors and shit are going oh yeah that that lead that came out of that, ga that fucking gasoline that shit would make you violent as fuck and make you crazy you know not everybody but certain people would get enough of it in their system and if they had, came from a bad environment would, would tip them over the edge they do fucking weird ass shit I'm thinking leaded gasoline had a lot to do with this kind of stuff yeah, like during this period, because, I'm sure that was a fact. Because it doesn't happen any, it, it doesn't happen at this rate anymore. Not these kind of sexual crimes. I mean, it does, but not not at the in same the rate. same way and not in the same rate. And it's not the same kind of weird intensity. It's, I think it's lead. Yeah, because obviously these people's brains were yeah. way fucked up. Yeah, I think it's uh, lead poisoning. Mister Eighty Eight said the toy box killer is one case I just avoid too sadistic and cruel yeah I mean we did a show about that didn't we yeah it was funny so you look at the dudes they're just fucking pussies well like I said a lot of them are fucking like that pussies. a lot of them are like that running around picking up teenage girls and fucking doing things like sticking ice picks in their ears and shit breaking their elbows with hammers in a van you know they think it's funny that ain't normal man that's fucking thank fuck for that yeah 
I think fucking leaded gasoline had a lot to do with it. I mean, anybody that gets amusement out of other people's suffering is suspect. I mean, they have people that is that are, not normal. They have people that do that today, but not at this level. You don't find these guys like you did back in the days. You know what I mean? When's the last time you heard of a really absurd crime like that? Yeah, I, been a well, long time. and I wonder sometimes is it just because we're catching them quicker or but see I don't think that's the case because no. I don't even, despite DNA and despite better investigative techniques and everything like that I think the unsolved the rate of unsolved crimes is just the same or actually worse I think than it was back in the day. Yeah, I think uh, the environment has changed and the people have changed, the culture it's just different. It's a different world now, and I think I think lead had a lot to do with it. Because, see, they couldn't come out and, and in the day. They put lead in gasoline to make the fucking. It was a toxic waste, really. And uh, somebody, uh, they even got the guy's name. He came up with the bright idea of fucking making it into tiny particles. So that's the la that's the last thing you want to do, is to make lead into tiny particles. Yeah, let's make it way easier to absorb into the bloodstream. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you take tiny particles of lead and put it into fuel. So when you're burning it in your car, it makes the valves sound a lot nicer when they close. You don't hear that tapping and racking in, in, in old-fashioned rocker box style valve trains. This is before dual overhead cams. And also the lead builds up in those areas and, you, and, and it gives a better seal in the valve. That's the thinking. That thinking is total bullshit, okay? The... the the seal of that valve in those old cars wouldn't even make you gain a horsepower. You know, it wouldn't make a big difference. And yeah, it, a car would run quieter, but so what? So what? It runs quieter. You're blowing all these fucking lead particles out the fucking tailpipe. Yeah, it's like, I'll take a little noise rather yeah. than just like polluting the entire environment. Yeah, the, the lead is not destroyed. It's just blown out through the exhaust and then it collects in all the urban areas and just blows around and people are fucking breathing it. Yep. Along with the other fucking smog because they didn't have catalytic converters back then. You know? And, uh, yeah, lead's fucking dangerous. It'll fucking make you crazy as shit. Just ask the ancient Romans. Part of the reason why the ancient Roman aristocracy was so fucking crazy is that they had fucking lead pipes bringing water to their neighborhoods. So the rich people were fucking crazy. The poor people weren't crazy. <laughs> okay? But that, that ended up really being a contributing factor to, to why Rome, the Roman Empire, failed. Uh, lead poisoning. That was a contributing. And they were using lead as a food additive. They'd sprinkle lead on food to make it taste better. And then they'd have lead plates because that made it taste better. Yeah, that's not... <laughs> Just go ahead and drink some fucking mercury. Okay? Might as well. While Might you're as well. At it. <laughs> with a with a little arsenic chaser. Yeah. But I think Victor well, said that's why the boomers are fucking nuts. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah. But the boomers are fucking nuts. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of that I think had to do with they were fucking breathing. Fucking I breathed a little bit of that fucking unlidded gasoline until that explains out. a lot, Tom. That's, that's why I'm fucking crazy. <laughs> okay, but no, they're fucking very crazy. Not all of them, but most of them. Most of the fun folks are crazy. Mr. 88 said, It is hard to tell. There are tens of thousands of people missing since the 70s. Some, probably many, were victims of people we can hardly imagine. Yeah, it's like, I'm every time I go back and look, I always find, you know, yeah, there's cases from nowadays, like, uh, but if you go back and look, like, the fucking 60s and 70s, there's people missing for act, and they still don't know what the fuck happened to them. There's always going to be a certain amount of them that were accidents, though. Well, yeah, that's uh, we're, yeah, we're, that's true. I uh, mean, they've had people missing for years, and then uh, a pond gets drained, and there's that person's car, and they're still in it, and they accidentally drove off the road and went to that pond. They found somebody like that, like yeah. somebody saw, saw it on uh, Google Earth. Yeah, they saw the car in the saw lake. Saw the car in the water. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff that happens. And then they have people that. Um, cars break down and then they walk out of the car and then fucking they get overcome by could be you know fucking cold weather there's all kinds of shit that happens yeah it's not necessarily it's not they're not necessarily all killed by serial killers yeah. but there's other ways to die yeah 
But I kind of feel like that might not be. I think it's probably more common that like somebody I, did something to them. I don't know. I think another real common thing is is that uh, they're in the country areas and the car runs off the road and they're killed on impact with a tree and the car sits down there for fucking years and years. Then they find the car and there's a dead person in it up in mountainous and country areas. That's one way. There's just a bunch of different ways. It, it, the statistics can all add up. Some of it's murders that are more for profit or boyfriends killing girlfriends or, you know, shit like that. And they get away with it. Not necessarily a serial killer. Husbands killing wives. Wives killing husbands. That happens too. Just Some people go missing because they kill themselves. Yeah, that can happen also. Although, Mr. Idiot points out, some are accidents... But a suspiciously high number of those missing are females aged 15 to 25. Not a high accident demographic. Yeah, right. That is true. Well, that's rape. Rape and murder. Doesn't doesn't mean it's the same guy doing that, though. Well, the thing... Well, what's scary, like I said, is that we've talked about a lot of serial killers on this show. I've written about a lot of serial killers. But there's always ones that I haven't heard about. I think there's a lot of guys out there, a lot of serial killers out there that only kill maybe two or three times, and then that's it. That's, and, and I think that's what gets a lot of them, those girls you're talking about. Just because a guy does it once doesn't mean he'll continue to do it. it it's got to be a spectrum disorder. That's what I would think. So, that, yeah, there's a lot of missing ones, but that's probably a lot of dudes that did that. But they only Which did is, a, I'm not sure if that's more scary or less scary. I think that's more scary. More scary. It's probably a lot of dudes did it, but they only did it once or twice. I mean, that's enough times, though, if, yeah. you're, if you're the one that gets unlucky yeah. enough to get picked up by this motherfucker. Yeah. It's probably what it means. I feel like in the 60s and 70s, it was when everybody was hitchhiking, It was a lot of it was, like, yeah. people that were hitchhiking or people that were, like, truckers and stuff like that. I kind of feel like there was a lot of them running around doing that shit. If you shit. did it once, you're probably much more likely to get away with it you continue to do it you get caught and those are the serial killers we know about so there's probably a lot more guys that only do it once or twice which like i said that's horrifying yeah. in itself that there's that many people it's, yeah. it's not surprising to me though yeah because like i said i write about crimes all the time so it's just kind of like well like i said it's probably like a spectrum disorder they want they they, they they're thinking about it they want to do it they do it and they go that wasn't cool i'm not gonna do that again it's like that yeah hopefully, hopefully I never get yeah. caught for that one right there's probably m- probably many more of those than anything I wonder yeah I would think so I would think that there were guys that are very borderline and they, and they just do it one time they and do it one like, time nah, and they I don't want to do like that. that yeah they didn't like that didn't I mean I guess that's possible it, it wasn't like I thought it was going to be That that's what it, that's probably the way I imagined it and they go on to live a normal life. I would think that's probably likely. Or maybe like they get I said, caught for something else. That's kind of fucked up to you. Or they, you know, they might be semi criminals and they get caught for something else. That's what I'm saying. Time. I kind of feel like if it gets to a point of like where you're murdering a stranger, yeah, um, you probably got some other shit going on. It may too. not be a stranger. Maybe a girl you go to school with, something like that. I don't know. It's still messed up. Yeah. It's messed up. Well, it's up. probably a young guy. Yeah. Probably you're talking stuff. about 12, 13, 14 They year old need to knock that shit off. It does it. Knock yeah. that shit off. It's probably what, it, what you're talking about. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess we better wrap it up because it's yeah, getting okay. very, very late and I have to yeah. get up very early in the morning. Yeah, it's 10.30. But, yeah, so this motherfucker, like I said, it's kind of a bummer that he got killed and wasn't able to, you know, give families closure about what happened or, you know, if they didn't know for sure that he had done some of these crimes. But on the other hand, I'm kind of glad the fucker got stabbed. And actually, um, one of the victim's moms, she said the same thing. She was like, I kind of want to send that dude a present. Yeah, you're like, fuck that dude. <laughs> for doing that. You know what I mean? Everybody yeah. was just kind of like, eh, good riddance. You know? Like I said, the dude that did it was no prize either because he was yeah. in prison for a double homicide, but... He, he did the world a solid, I guess. Yeah. All right. If uh, you guys are listening to this recorded, go ahead and send us a fucking um, super thanks if you want to. I think it's a little green button there. Unless the place is, unless it's demonetized <laughs> by the time you hear this. 
Well, no, yeah. demonetized just means you can't show ads on okay. it. Okay, they can still send a super thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, that's okay. You just okay. can't. They just won't put ads on it because of All right. advertisers don't want to mm-hmm. be on a thing where it's talking about serial killers. But yeah, so thanks everybody for dropping by and listening to this horrifying, grim show this evening. Because, like I said, this was a dude I didn't know a great deal about, even though it's in Florida. Well, this was a little bit before I was born, but still. So, yeah, this was, like, pretty fucking horrifying. So, um, yeah, hopefully you guys can drop by again on Friday night for the Sidetrack show, which is always fun. We'll have some drinks, and we'll just talk about whatever just pops into our heads, which is always a good time. So hopefully you guys can come by for that, and we will see you guys again on Friday. Good night.